Good evening. Welcome to the Deerfield Board of Selectmen, uh, Select Board Board of Health meeting for July 14th, uh, 2021 at 6.01. Our meeting is held at the main meeting room, Deerfield Municipal Offices at 8 Conway Street, South Deerfield. The meeting will be held in a hybrid fashion with the opportunity for both in-person attendance and remote participation in accordance with Governor Baker's June 16th, 2021 Act, uh, extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency, including the extension of remote participation provisions of his March 20th, 2020 executive order, suspending certain provisions of open meeting law, general law, um, uh, Chapter 30A, Section 20. Please note that while an option for a remote attendance and or participation is being provided as a courtesy to the public, the meeting hearing will not be suspended or terminated if technology um, problems interrupt the virtual broadcast unless otherwise required by law. Members of the public will, with per particular interest in any specific item on the agenda should make plans for in-person versus virtual attendance accordingly. For the purpose of in-person attendance, the town of Deerfield will host the meeting in the main meeting room of the Deerfield Municipal Offices with remote participation details listed below. Dial-in phone number 312-626-6799. Meeting ID is 911-604-1584. Is five seven zero zero one two, and for uh, signing on the Zoom, uh, sign on to the uh, Town of Deerfield's website and go to the meeting, and put, you'll be able to pull up that Zoom account. So, okay. Okay. Uh, We don't have any scheduled hearings or appearances this evening. So uh, the next thing is uh, selectman reports and announcements. Um, I attended um, the uh, select board training to get again today. And um, it was about emerging issues with technology and the open meeting law by Lauren Goldberg, which was excellent. But they also had a municipal um, finance part of it and um, pretty much we're doing all the best practices already, you know, like Brenda gives us some monthly reports and all that kind of stuff that we follow. But what was really interesting uh, was ARPA money could be used for OPEB. You're not supposed to use it for um, pensions, but you could use it for OPEB. So I, one of the things I thought in the back of our mind, I'm not in support of a huge amount of money, but you, you know, say we, decide to do the Leary lot and we set aside 350,000 or whatever we decide to do. And it comes in at 325 and we have 25 left over. And, you know, once we decide what we're gonna do and we take that pot of money, I think, you know, just putting whatever is left over so it's zeros out into OPEP might be a way to go. Good thought. Whatever it is. Yeah. You know, yeah. Not, yep. not thinking of any dedicated amount or right, anything right. like that, but just <laughs> if we can zero it out Absolutely. Uh, you know, and put it into OPEB. I think that's a pretty good yeah. yeah. So anyway, so that was a good little tidbit. Yeah. Good. Um, I have a little bit on the, uh, so I had a couple of meetings today uh, that were in Wiener on the tour. Trevor? <clears throat> yep. Yes. Speak closer to the mic, please. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I had a meeting with the uh, DPC engineering suite and Kevin and I met um, on Pineland Road and we took a, a drive to the top and then a walk down and we uh, evaluated all the, uh, you know, took a look at all the infrastructure issues with, uh, we know that the sewer line, you know, pretty much top to bottom, kind of where it's supposed to start, not all the way up, the sewer doesn't go all the way up, but from there down, a lot of that is uh, pipe replacement, cut and replace. And then um, the last section, and then some out to the uh, past the railroad and out to 5 and 10 is just lying in place. Um, so we evaluated that a bit. And with that work going on, we're kind of coming up with a, a preliminary engineering plan so we can get the scope of cost for that work to rehabilitate the road and the sewer and the swales and the guardrails 
um, it's going to convert to, to the shot. Um, so we, we want that, got all that information today, so we'll have a report on that fairly soon, we hope, and then we can kind of keep that process moving with what that cost is. Um, and then I sat in on the first, um, the first construction progress meeting, number one, for the South Deerfield Wastewater Treatment Plant. And that, uh, that project that was good, uh, Waterline was there and um, USDA and of course DPC and, and the town was represented. Um, we went over the progress. Um, so last month activities were installed, the cliff fence and installed silk sock uh, for the erosion control requirements. Uh, they cleared and rubbed the proposed work areas, began excavation of, of foundation layout uh, for the proposed headworks building. Uh, Saw out the 16 pavement for the proposed 30 inch uh, pipe trench, um, installed and tied in 12 inch uh, diameter PVC bypass so they bypassed the system so they could start to work on it. Um, they installed the uh, one on site diesel tank, including the bollards for, uh, for the fire department request, um, removed a uh, portion of the 24 inch diameter uh, dump battle iron pipe from the footprint of the proposed headworks building. There's also finding Trevor. Yes. Yeah, it's not people online aren't hearing you very well. I'm like just about beating the microphone. So I'm, I'm wondering if, if you could that. use one of the other ones. Try. Okay. We'll wait. Maybe they'll, they'll bring another one out. Okay. Um, so we uh, removed a portion of the 24 inch diameter ductile pipe. They also did find that there is a um, where the generators were, there were two pads that are typically a foot thick. The center one was for some reason four feet thick. So we knew we'll actually have cut that one out. Nobody was aware of it. That was about the only chain door that came up so far. So we're working on that. Um, so next month, next month's activities are to continue excavating the foundation layout for the proposed headworks building, uh, begin drip chamber excavation, uh, set forms for drip removal uh, system slab. Um, and then we just we just kind of went over some of the submittals and stuff that are still outstanding. So uh, pretty good overall. So they're on schedule and, and doing well. So that was that. Um, Kevin did look at River Road, you know, he, um, yep. since the storms. And so I am going to approach um, NRCS state office tomorrow when I'm at a meeting and just bring it up and put it on the radar and, and log in these events, ongoing events between Elsa and East Storm. So we'll right. see what we can do. Okay, good. Um, you know, obviously we've had a, a fair amount of rain in the last couple of weeks. Uh, you know, we had the abnormal day or two day period where we had one of the highest temperatures recorded and one of the lowest temperatures recorded for the day within 24 hours. Wow. So, that was interesting, yeah. but um, obviously uh, with the ground as wet as it is, uh, there's a lot of things that are unstable, particularly trees, um, like the one that went down near my house <laughs> that took out the power lines and the transformer. And um, it just, there wasn't any wind or anything. It was just wet and it just tipped. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this is going to be a problem. And so, you know, and you know we have a severe thunderstorm warning right now for this area yes. um, and so you know there may be trees down so we just ask you to be cautious uh any standing water or anything like that make sure you you stay away from it uh, with your vehicles because it can swallow up a car fairly easy um so yeah. i know kevin's doing an excellent job trying to keep everything clear but there's only you know so much you can do uh, the town of Deerfield has over 100 miles of roads in it, and there's only so much you can do in a short period of time. So, can I make a quick statement? Um, so, our meetings are hybrid, but if people want to hear what's going on, you need to be in person. So, we're, we're going to talk about this a little bit later on. We're doing the best we can with technology, but it's horrendous. It's very hard to make this, this project work. If these meetings are super important to you, and you want to hear what's going on and participate live, please come to the meeting. We're going to do everything we can to make sure the technology is loud enough that people can hear. We're investing almost $10,000 in the cameras and sound 
we don't have it yet, but um, we're working on that. But if there's something that's really interesting to you and you, you'd like to participate in democracy, please come down to the town hall. I know it's inconvenient, it's so much easier to just do it at home with a cook and dinner and you can have it on the background. And we think that's great. And we want as much participation as possible, but you know, it's, it's hard for us to talk, you know, like I can't be even hit you with the microphone all the time. So it's gonna be, until we get new sound equipment, it's gonna be a bit of a challenge. So we'd love to have you come and, and join. We'll do the best we can when we talk, but we can't really be eating a microphone at the same time. So we'll do our best. Much better, Trevor. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Um, I just want to mention also, I want to thank Kevin. Um, he is putting out B BTI dunks all over town. Obviously, as Dave referred to, all the weather that we're having, Kevin has been a lava siding as much as possible to pre prevent um, mosquito uh, problems. We haven't had any um, disease load this year so far, which is Wonderful. We normally it shows up in uh, July, uh, the first week in July. So we've made it so far, and um, that's good news. But the mosquitoes, there is tremendous impact already with the water that we've had for the last few days. With the mosquito population has really jumped up. So please patrol your yard, dump anything that you know, standing water from your flower pots, anything. Um, we're doing as much as we can. And again, thank you to Kevin who is. Um, making sure our catch basins are treated and and throwing out this everywhere that you know there's standing wetland waters which are just about everywhere in town right now yeah. okay um board of health announcements well that was that was your board of health announcement yeah. okay well except please be careful um we our unvaccinated population is is still our little kids and so um you know if you haven't been vaccinated, please try to be vaccinated. Um, it will really protect our community. I'm really proud of our community. Uh, we have a very, very high um, vaccination rate. And I think that's one of the reasons we have another week with no cases. We had one a couple of weeks ago, but haven't right. had anything since. Right. So um, really appreciate everyone being vigilant on that. Continuing just to wear a mask in enclosed spaces where you might not be sure everyone is vaccinated. That's probably the best um, activity you can do. Mm -hmm. That Delta virus uh, area, it seems to be, I mean, you're seeing it with all, on the news and, and it's climbing in a lot of places because a lot, and looking at the death toll, um, I think it was, I think it, uh, of the people who have passed away recently, I think 0.08% were vaccinated, like 98%, 90 something percent. And 99.2. 99.2 were, were not vaccinated. So it, it makes sense, you know, to, to just get the vaccination super easy and, um, you know, we do that if we can. Yep. As, soon as, as soon as the um, vaccine is available for the under 12s, we'll be, you know, having a clinic here. Yeah. Um, we really will. But in the meantime, just be careful. Um, it's very sad to hear, like in Mississippi, that there's so many kids in the ICU down there. That's horrible. Yeah. And, you know, as Trevor was saying, the uh, national statistics right now are 99.2 people that are either on ventilators or have subscribed to COVID, the Delta variants, um, have not been vaccinated. So uh, the people that have been vaccinated, some of them are still getting COVID, but they're not getting anywhere near as sick. So it's, uh, it's important. Um, I know there's some skeptics about it, but uh, let's, you know, start looking at the facts and, um, you know, uh, people were skeptical of the polio vaccine and a few other things when they came out, uh, but, you know, so. Okay. Okay. Next thing on our agenda are the minutes of previous meetings. Um, do you want to do them individually or do you want to? Sure. Okay. I, I make a motion to approve the minutes of February 17th, 2021. I'll second that motion, Trevor McDaniel. Okay. Any further discussion? No. no. All those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Aye, Dave Wolfram. Um, I make a motion to approve uh, June 22nd, 
2021. I'll second that motion, Trevor McDaniel. Okay. Any further discussion? Nope. Not hearing none. All those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Aye, Dave Wolfram. Make a motion for July 1st, 2021. I'll second that motion, Trevor McDaniel. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Aye, Dave Wolfram. I make a motion for July 9th, 2021. I'll second that. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Aye, Dave Wolfram. I make a motion for um, July 11th, 2021, that we approve it. Okay. Wait a second. Oh. Um, I'm just trying to find it here. I have to get to them. Why don't I see July 11th? It's on. It's on the back. Um, I'm hunting for it. It's it's further into your packet, Trevor. Oh, I thank you. I, I know I read it. <laughs> I saw the. Uh, okay. It's the priorities. Uh, oh, there it is. No, I think so. Well, oh, that's I know not it's it. here somewhere. I read them. Wow. Did you find it, Trevor? Not yet. Oh, there it is. Yep, I see it. I see it. So I'll make a motion to approve the July 11th meeting minutes. Okay. Well, then I'll second it. Mm -hmm. okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? No, I, Trevor McDaniel. I, Dave Wolfram. I, Carolyn Ness. Great. Thank you. Okay. Okay, the next thing on our agenda are transfers. Um, do you want to address the uh, from the Finance Committee last night, Casey, or? Yes. The uh, Finance Committee approved the three transfers that you will see, and these are transfers that are between appropriation, which require both the Finance Committee and the Select Board. The first one was a $200 request from Select Board Administrative Expense into Select Board staff salaries. And this was based on a need to make a correction for employee longevity pay that we didn't discover until after the fiscal year had begun. Did you want to do them different separately or do you want to do them all at once? It's up to you. I mean, they're all pretty straightforward. Separately. separately. They're pretty straightforward. Okay. So I'll explain the second one. The second one is for $250 from the accountant's expense into the accountant's salary to cover additional hours spent uh, for CARES Act and FEMA reporting. Okay. And the third one is $610 from Board of Health Infection Control into the Board of Health Agent's salary to cover additional expenses on health-related matters, unanticipated. Okay. So make a motion, you want to vote each one separately? So we, for sure. Um, so make a motion to approve the first um, transfer for $200. I'll second that. Okay. Any discussion? No. Nope. Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Aye, Dave Wolfram. Make a motion to approve the uh, $250 transfer for um, accountant salary. I'll second that. Any further discussion? Nope. All those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Aye, Dave Wolfram. And I make a motion for the last one for $610 uh, to the Board of Health agent salary. Um, second that. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Aye, Dave Wolfram. Great. And then it must be. Oh, there's signatures here. So I'll start and send them on there. Yes, we need okay. you to sign them. Okay, the next thing on our agenda are appointments. Uh, first one is for the fur pub. Um, yeah. 
The uh, three, right? On the first one, uh, I'll uh, nominate Trevor and Daniel to be our, continue as our representative to the FERCOC. And I'll second that. Thank you for the council. Yeah. Um, any further discussion? Um, are we gonna just going to keep Casey too? As, a, as, as the keep, alternate, Casey yes, as the alternate. Yes. 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 So uh, why don't we just amend the motion to include the alternate? Okay. Casey yep. Okay. Sounds good. I'll second that then. Mm -hmm. uh, any further discussion? Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Aye, Dave Wolfram. Okay. Let's see. We have now we have the others. The public oversight for the health. Do you, yeah, Carolyn. Do you want to take that over? Um. Okay. All right. Great. I'll make a motion to appoint uh, Carolyn Ness to the uh, Public Health Service Oversight Board. Okay. Um, do we need an alternate for that, Casey? We should. Um, if you want. But okay. All right. Why don't we do that? Okay. Sure. Okay. So the motion is for Carolyn to be representative and Trevor to be the alternate. I'll second that. Second. Oh, oh okay. Or I you second. Made the motion. I'm in the motion. Second, sir. Okay. Can't do both. <laughs> okay. Um, any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor? I, Trevor McDaniel. I, Carolyn Ness. I, Dave Wolfram. Um, the REPC I attend. That's you, right? Yeah. Yeah. I would rather you keep you. No, no. Okay. I, if you, you, yeah, I, I, I would. Because I, I fill two positions. Because I, yep. uh, Matt fill. Uh, Matt completely, fill yeah. I, I would, um, I would make a motion to have um, Carolyn Ness continue as the regional emergency planning committee representative. All right. Well, yeah, I go. Yeah. Right. Or I will. I'll do. second that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we are thinking of merging with Mapco at some point down the line after the AAR is over. Okay. After action report. So I don't know what's going to happen. But yeah. anyway. So MAPCO, um, you sit on as well, right? Yeah, and that's I different I than that. RA. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Right, right. That's the Mohawk Area Public Health Coalition. Yeah. The problem is REPC doesn't have um, a lot of funding. And we have... we. MAPCO has funding from the state and we have deliverables from the state and we have to make sure that we can be able to deliver them yeah. every year. So I don't know. We'll, we're moving forward on that just because we need to, we need to have a more robust yep. re emergency response. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that's oh, absolutely. Yeah. an yep. issue. I agree. So we're moving forward with that anyway. Yep. And the last one was for the Franklin County Cooperative Inspection Program, which we We're do not, not participate in. Correct. Did we vote? Uh, let's see. I don't know if we voted on that. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. sorry. So we made a motion and a second? Yeah, yep. I seconded it. Okay. So any further discussion? No. Nope. All those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Aye, Dave Wolfram. Let's see, let's just fill that out. And then, do you uh, want to go over the assistant highway? Yes. Public Works Superintendent Casey? Yes. So I gave you a memo. We had some final tweaks we needed to make to that memo this morning, so I wasn't able to get it into the packet. But essentially, it's a recommendation for hire of an assistant highway slash public works superintendent. We have been working on this hiring process for quite some time. So what I do in the memo is I outline the hiring process. And so I'll do that now. As has been past practice, our internal process was facilitated with input and collaboration amongst department heads that really would have a strong intersect with this 
position in a similar manner as how the assistant super, the assistant town administrator was hired. Um, so that's how we started. We defined what that was going to be. We clarified with the personnel board the range to publish in the vacancy notice as we were developing that vacancy notice. And the range was grade five, steps five through nine, or between 63,000 and 74,000 of the 2021 classification compensation plan. And we had that conversation with the personnel board, they approved it. We finalized the notice, which included a brief description of the duties and pay range and was posted on the town's website, our bulletin board here in the foyer, Indeed, which is a recruitment website and in the newspaper. And we also, which is also a, a regular occurrence, we put the job description up on the website with that vacancy notice so that there was a direct correlation when people were interested in more research on the position. And candidates were required to present an application as part of that process, sending their information in to us. So we received 14 applications. And after review of those applications, five candidates were selected for interviews. One candidate chose not to participate in the process going forward and notified us of that. So four interviews were held with standardized questions asked of each candidate. Again, it's a best practice that we follow on a regular basis. And at the conclusion of those interviews, one candidate stood out amongst the group. His name is Christopher Miller. He's a resident of Hatfield. He has many years of private and public sector experience and private sector experience working in large construction companies responsible for project planning, management and supervision of personnel, both union and non-union, um, road construction, maintenance, drainage, pipe work, that sort of construction work. But in a public sector capacity, uh, Miller served as the highway superintendent and water commissioner for the town of Hatfield. And so those responsibilities included, again, road construction and maintenance, drainage, sewer lines, grounds and buildings maintenance, snow and ice removal, personnel supervision, in a similar manner as what we have now, full part-time and seasonal, and budget administration. Um, so there's also an intersect in Mr. Miller's experience as a water commissioner in Hatfield. So there's that understanding of how those things work. Um, so our recommendation is to hire Mr. Miller at grade five, step seven, or an annual salary of $70,866. The position itself as assistant public works highway superintendent is exempt and is not allocated overtime. Further, our suggestion is upon successful completion of the six month probationary period, we would increase the annual salary of grade five, to grade five step eight or 73810. And these are amounts that are based on the implemented FY 2022 classification plan since we've moved into the new fiscal year, but fit within the range that was published. Second, we request that the, and I'm saying this, the royal we, this is Kevin and I writing the memo, <laughs> which I didn't tell you in the beginning. <laughs> and poor Kevin. Second, we request that the select board authorize the town administrator to present an offer letter to Miller. And if that is accepted, uh, proceed with the hiring process internally. Um, Casey, did you, um, I, I hadn't heard. So this is this position is definitely settled as exempt and no- It is overdue. not settled as exempt, but that is how it's presented right now. And I really don't wanna get too far into that because that could be a- Okay. Something we need to keep in negotiations. I, I was surprised because it's published it. as exempt, which is how yeah, it was drafted. That's because it's <clears throat> it's going through a state review. All right. Uh, and they're taking their time. Okay. So I um. So I trust the committee that did the search, and I. I fully support moving forward. I, I was under the impression that we were going to whittle down to a couple and then we would have some some time to interview uh, and, and get an idea of who, you know, who we wanted. But um, we have good people that run. I trust Casey. I trust everybody that's been involved. So I, I, I'm fine with moving forward. So, yeah. that's all. 
Yeah, no, I'm fine with it too. Okay. You want to form a vote then? Yes. Okay. I will make that motion um, to um, appoint um, Christopher Miller to <clears throat> the exempt position as assistant superintendent, grade five, step seven. I'll second that motion. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Aye, Dave Wolfram. The second is to authorize the town administrator to present an offer letter to Mr. Miller for acceptance. I will make that motion. I'll second that motion, Trevor. Any further discussion? Okay. Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Aye, Dave Wolfram. Thank you, and thank you to the committee that uh, worked on that. Yes on the interview Thank process, you, Casey. appreciate it. It was more of an internal thing because, and one thing that I will say is this isn't a, as any different than how the assistant town administrator process was completed. So if it was a department head, a formal search committee, I would have suggested a formal search committee, but mm -hmm. in terms of a, a management position of this nature, it that process, we followed what had been done actually with the assistant town administrator's yeah. position. So just for clarification. Yep. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Is that Kevin? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, it's the K-man. Look at him. One letter. Um, the K-man, yeah. <laughs> Kevin, I just want to thank you Kevin. again. For, um, I don't know if you were here when I thanked you for um, putting out the lava side. Thank you. Oh, no I really problem. do appreciate you doing that. I'm trying to stay on top of it. I know, but... It's one of those things that it was lovely to have you just do it without me having to chase you down. So thank you. You've already embedded it in my head, so I'm good. Yeah. I know, I know, I know. We can still see the probes <laughs> connected there. <laughs> thank you, Kevin. I just want you to know I appreciate it. The thank whole you. town does. And thank you for the support on the uh, assistance. The uh, relief will be greatly appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. I know. I hope this will help you. I'm sure it will. Chris yeah. is, I think he's going to be a good fit. That's yeah. right. Okay. Maybe you'll get to spend a little more time on the island. <laughs> no, Hopefully. I don't like people, so no. I don't go there so much. <laughs> October, November, December. Mm. <clears throat> okay. Uh, next thing on the uh, is the planning board consulting contract. For review and approval. So does anybody need any background? Really, it's a formulaic request for the board to just look at it and authorize me to sign it. This has already been reviewed by the planning board. It's for services for ZBA uh, zoning changes. And Annalise in the audience, she can wave her hands if I'm doing this wrong. But my understanding is it is for zoning changes that the planning board would like to continue with it's two contracts and the reason I'm asking the board to just take a moment and look at it is because from a contract management perspective certain things have to be in place funding and the oversight of the terms and so we're trying to eliminate some of the difficulties we've run into in the past um, just making sure that the connections happening between the town accountant and us me from a contract perspective, because a lot of times I will review contract terms. It's part of the training process that um, MCPPOs go through, the municipal certified procurement officers. So I, I would appreciate it if the board would just take a look through it. And it's something that I think the planning board would like to proceed with. So if we could just have you authorize a signatory, we can move forward with that. But this we, is a statutory so, oh, responsibility okay. for the select board. No, I was just going to say that who we vote to have you sign it, but it looks like you yep. already set it up that way. So that's perfect. Okay. okay. Emily, do you want to make any comments on it? No, the planning board unanimously approved moving forward with this, especially as Casey was saying, we brought one person to the avenue to continue efforts in the first year of the bylaws. Is there a mic that Lily can talk into? Yeah. Yes. Or sorry, I mean Annalie. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry, Lily. 
<laughs> yes, the planning board has unanimously approved this. And um, we want to certainly move forward with um, updating our solar bylaws as we promised at town meeting and then moving forward otherwise as potentially we may. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would um, make a motion to approve um, Casey as um, signatory um, on the contract. Our contracts. Hmm. I'll second that. Um, any further discussion? Nope. Carolyn? Okay. okay. Um, the only thing I ask is that whoever is working with you folks, that there um, be a little bit better coordination between the administrator's office and because there was a number of things this last year that kind of fell through and we had to do a lot of catch up. And we just want to make sure those aren't happening again. So we want to make sure we're improving the comp the communication between uh, Chris and the selectman's office. Okay. Thank you. Are you talking about invoicing in particular or? No, no just what the projects are, what, what's happening with them and his follow through on them and things like that to make sure that uh, we're, we don't have to try to fill in blanks that we're not sure about. So it's just a matter of communication between Chris and the administrator and the selectman's office. Okay, so perhaps um, out of this meeting, I can talk with you for more details to make sure, sure. we uh, do what you're yeah. requesting. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I quite just, understand. Um, you sure. Know, because, well, part of it is, you know, was COVID. Uh, sure. The other part, we had MVP grants that were all over the place. And, you know, there was just so much going on. And sometimes it would just, unfortunately, got confusing. Okay. And some of the things were getting dropped that shouldn't have got dropped right away. Not necessarily Chris's issue it's just because of the communication between him and and this office here okay so, so we just want to make sure that everything you know because perhaps you should talk with Casey yeah, and we don't want things to fall because you know the mvp grants have been important for the town sure and you know there is a fair amount of administrative work that goes with them and we want to make sure everything's getting done in a timely manner and that we're doing you know so that puts us in a, a lot better position for further grants Sure. Um, I just want to mention, I forgot that to bring this up. Um, yesterday uh, was a, you know, a meeting that I attended with Carolyn Markfield. She's the MVP, like second in charge. There's 300, 300 million that was just approved for MVP. So Whoa. it's being funded again. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So uh, Jennifer. Are you taking comment? Because I have somebody on Anne Mary has. Yes, we're taking ahead. public comment. Sure. Go ahead, Anne Mary. I guess I'm just wondering if the planning board has done something specific to jeopardize our standing with these grants. No. No, I don't think so. What's up? Ha no, has I the planning so. board done anything specific? No, it has no. nothing to do with that. Okay. No. All right. Thank you. No. None at all. Yep. Mm. I'm having trouble hearing that. I, guess I know, it's tough. I'm going to have to get hearing aids. We're going to get better sound, I promise. Yeah, well, it's coming. It's, it's coming. I can't hear anything anyway, so. <laughs> so. Okay. So, uh, Great. Approved. So we had. Uh, all those in favor? Yeah. I, Trevor McDaniel. I, Carolyn Ness. I, Dave Wolfram. And that's for both uh, contracts, right? Both contracts for Casey to sign. Yes. Right, for Casey to sign. Yeah, okay. perfect. Okay. Or, or she will be the signature. Right. Person. Yep. Doesn't have to go to us. I think we discussed, I thought we discussed that we were going to go hybrid. And, and well, we were going to, um, I mean, that's why we were spending the money for the equipment. Yes. But can I just, and that I think we need to do yeah. hybrid. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to, I guess I wanted to have the discussion because, you know, what's really difficult is, you know, obviously town business still needs to happen and we always need to have meetings. Um, but if everyone relies on them being hybrid and technology fails us, then 
you know, everyone's scrambling or running back from home and like trying to run around and get everything up and running and just so that we can hold the meeting. And I just think if, if, if boards could commit to at least having a quorum present so they could conduct business. Um, Actually, that was what the Lauren Goldberg was talking about today. She said that we, you just have to set rules. Yep. Um, but I know the Conservation Commission wants to do remote because it's easier for um, the, you know, the engineers and stuff that present. So um, all you have to do, if, if, if you go down for more than six hours, then it, you, you know, the posting doesn't count. There are certain things that they have now come out with. Um, I'd have to go through the notes. I sent you the slides, Casey, um, but the full thing is, you know, has, will be posted in a day or two. But one of the things they said is that if you have, if your your technology goes down, then the meeting is has to cease, even. And that's my concern. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a big concern of mine. That's is that the case. that's not okay. the case? If, Thank if you, it's Casey. all remote, remote it's Casey. If it's all remote, but what yes. we've done, and, and actually I'll commend Jennifer on this. She contacted council and clarified this because when the hybrid changed, when it became allowable, we had to change the language on our postings, which you all noted when you saw. Yeah. Right, but I mean, if if a Zoom goes down, then the whole meeting is canceled. If it's a it's if it's a hundred percent, you know, not in person. Right, but if, if it's not a quorum. But have we approved all remote meetings? I thought we'd approved hybrid. I'll let Jennifer. Oh, okay. Jennifer? Well, we, we let the boards decide what they want to yeah, do. I'm going to, I'm going to mute you while I speak because then there's no echo. Um, so I put out an email to all the boards and committees to, you know, when they request their uh, agendas to be posted, they let me know at that time, uh, one of three options. So it's, all in person with getting me minutes within 48 hours, um, 24 to 48 hours. Uh, number two uh, would be all remote and we would have a recording and we would do just like we, we were doing during, you know, height of COVID. And the third would be hybrid and that the language changes on the agenda depending on um, which, which way that they want it. But I just need to know ahead of time. So then I know which way um, to do the posting, but and some people have told me. So what, and I'm just want to make sure that we're following the law. When we, when we ask for hybrid, people can do either or. Correct. That's fine. So I, I'm happy being flexible, but my concern is just that um, technology is, especially in here is, is woefully inadequate. And I just worry like that we're, you know, I mean, the planning board the other night was just so difficult for them. It was, you know, I'm, I'm getting calls, you know, Alex is home, he has to come back. And it's all because the internet goes out. And if you can't run a meeting, um, you know, especially if you have presenters here and ready to go, I just want to make sure that we're setting up the right expectation for people to. Um, well, hopefully, when, when, you know, when we get the better sound system, I'm going to mute you again, sorry. When we get the better sound system, that will iron out that. And definitely you're correct, Trevor, if you wanna have clearer, um, you, you have to go in person. Casey has her hand raised. So to that comment, Trevor, um, what we did was in our allowance, in our new meeting posting, it does give the committee the allowance to continue the meeting in person. And that expectation would then be to provide minutes within that reasonable period of time. If you're if you're conducting, my understanding is today from today's meeting, that if you are in person, and the internet goes down, you can continue your meeting. Right. And if, if you it are interrupts all the Zoom broadcast, and the internet goes down, your meeting is canceled. Right. And that's what I'm saying. As long as I just want people to think about uh, how much you know. People are waiting on these meetings. They wait for a, an appointment at a planning board or a zoning board or something like that. And, you know, applications come. And I just want to make sure the business of the town keeps going. Um, and, and we have enough people in person so that they have enough quorum. And then if 
somebody's on vacation or whatever, or is away and still wants to participate or people want to participate from home that I love to have more people online. It's, it's perfect. Um, you know, we have more people online than we have in the audience today and that's great. Um, but I just want to make sure that the business of the town can keep going. And if it's something really serious and people want to make sure that they're hearing and being able to have a voice, they show up like that's like number one is you show up if you want to have your voice heard. And then we try everywhere else to do make accommodation. So the biggest problem is actually hybrid. Exactly. Um, Tim's waiting to speak, and I'm gonna. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Tim. Just give me one sec. Um, the the biggest problem is hybrid. So the reason I brought it up is because the conservation commission has decided to go forward with remote meetings, and if everybody recalls. This is a, another pivot moment. We had some struggles in the beginning of COVID with remote participation. So we're, we're sort of back at square one, struggling to, to meet everybody's expectations, but also be able to provide all the options we can. A lot of towns weren't able to even do remote for a very long time. So we're positioned very well. But the choice for the, the reason I bring this up is because I wanted to draw everybody's attention to the fact that there is a time factor when we're planning for this, doing all this setup. Some committees are choosing or could choose to go completely remote. Some committees could choose to be completely in person. And the requirements around those are a little bit different because public comment is a different requirement hearing versus meeting. So what I'm trying to do is just bring this to everybody's attention that, that Jennifer and FCAT and Alex and you know Trevor, we were we were all trying to work, but in terms of dealing with the technological issues, we, re we respectfully request people's patience because we're learning as we're going. We have new equipment that's coming, but it isn't here yet. And so Trevor's comment about if you really wanna hear, you come in, well, that may not be true in you know two weeks. We could have a completely different setup that works fine. So I would really just ask for people's patience and now I'll shut up so Tim can talk. <laughs> you know, our staff, our staff, I'm really concerned with an FCAT and, you know, everyone's scrambling to try and figure this stuff out. And we'll, we'll have a learning curve when we get the sound stuff too, and the new camera and tr trying to nail all that down is going to be um, a bit of a learning curve. But, uh, you know, as we got, we've learned all, all along last year, we'll figure this one out too. I just want to make sure that people, if they want to be heard, show up is the best way. And then we'll, we'll figure out the rest to try and provide as much access as we can. Okay. Okay. Uh, Tim? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, at the Conservation Commission's last meeting, we voted to hold the next meeting remote, and we're certainly open to, um, once the new equipment arrives, letting the select board work out all the kinks, and then, um, you know, be going, going to a hybrid setting um, that works for everyone. You know, we, we just uh, felt that uh, in the short term, until the the hybrid situation is cleaned up, this would be easier for people, uh, particularly con consultants that travel from Connecticut and, and in the eastern part of the state. So um, certainly going forward, we're going to review this at every meeting. Yep. Yeah, remote definitely seems easier than the hybrid, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, but, you know, I'm in favor of continuing the hybrid until, you know, well, to whenever, but um, to the glaciers come back. <laughs> but um, because, you know, in a number of years that I participated in local government, I would say on an average, we had two people in the audience listening mm -hmm. to the board. Three today. On we an average. Three today. Thank See, you. We're above average right now with yes. just people sitting here. <laughs> but right now we have 19 people yeah. signed on. So... You know, uh, even though they may not be participating, at least they're listening and they're better informed mm -hmm. about what's happening in the town of Deerfield. Yeah. Uh, and here again, communication is key on a lot of these things. So it's very important. And um, people pick up a lot quicker when they're actually listening to it and as opposed to trying to sign on to a website later and get or going on the uh, watching it on TV later, so, um, so. Good. Uh, Dennis Lanier just called and said that 
there's at least 2,000 CFS capacity at Brookfield and it would stop raining if there. So, Good. Carolyn, just speak into the mic, please. Um, I was just uh, look, passing on that Dennis Sinier, uh the fire chief in Charlemont, has called and said that um, there is at least 2,000 CFS capacity at Brookfield and he feels that that's enough and um, that it has stopped raining up there. So we should be okay. This has to do with the Harriman Dam overflow and all the water that's going yeah. through. There was an incident there just before our meeting started yeah. with an explosion and we weren't sure what the concern would be. Um, those of us who were around for Sandy, remember that one of the first keys to the major flooding we had was when the Harriman was breached. Mm -hmm. And it started the cascading down the Deerfield, and so we try to keep as close an eye on that area as we can. And of course, Carolyn is she listened to her phone. You know, she's getting constant updates. So I'm a wreck. <laughs> yeah, but she did bring sticky buns to our meeting on she Sunday. Did. So you know, we'll for, forgive her for everything. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, you missed it. out. Oh, you missed out. See, you have to be in person. They were very you, good. You missed it. <laughs> you can't eat one of those virtually. <laughs> so, okay. Um, next thing on our agenda is a uh, COVID assessment. Do you want to address this, Carolyn? Or? Well, um, Kevin, uh, well, we've been waiting for this for two and a half years. Um, and Casey, you um, don't have the final report yet, right? No, but we don't have the final report. The reason I wanted to bring it up was simply to put it on people's radar screen because Megan and Ryan, so Megan Rhodes and Ryan Clary are finishing this up. And one of the things that they've noticed, and I mentioned this to Kevin and to, Guy, to everybody, I mentioned it to Carolyn individually, was that this may require us to sort of rethink our maintenance program and Kevin's got a plan for that, but there could be some additional expenses. So once we get the report, we'll need to talk about it and sort of start the planning process of how we're gonna address it and present it to finance committee and everybody else as we move forward into next year's budget process. Did, you, did they give you a um, timeline when this is supposed to come? No, we, but I can ask Megan again. Yeah, we, we just want the two or three top priority ones to be replaced so that they're ready to go. And then um, uh, and then Kevin, maybe when Chris Miller's on board, we can um, have a meeting to discuss um, a maintenance program that, you know, what resources Kevin needs to have a better, more robust uh, maintenance program. Because mm -hmm. uh, we need documentation in case there, we have a big event FEMA will want to make sure it's not a maintenance issue, that it is actually a blowout of the culverts. So we just have to make sure we have clear documentation for that. Yeah. We've had pretty bad experience in the past. Um, in 2007, when Upper Road collapsed, um, FEMA just said it was bad maintenance and we didn't have any documentation to argue with that. And that you know, was a half a million dollars out of the town of Deerfield's pocket. We need to really pay attention to that. Kind of give you a scope of what there is in the town of Deerfield. Uh, they've done half the roads and they've checked 348 culverts. Yeah. So it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, and the north end of town was already done and that was 191 culverts. Yep. I got that done. And that's the OT did that yeah. for us. So it, uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of culverts, a lot of maintenance has to be done on them. Um, you know, those who know the history of some of our maintenance. Um, we lost a police cruiser right after we got one, mm -hmm. the Explorer. They decided to give it a bath. It didn't work well. Um, the engine was ruined. Uh, shortly after that, we had an employee that was actually washed down through a culvert. Yep. Unfortunately, believe you lived. it spit them out the other end. Yep. And he didn't get stuck. But, well, that was pretty scary, actually. Um, that's, I can't imagine that, but mm -hmm. you know, it's. Uh, Especially if you saw that culvert. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, being claustrophobic um, now, uh, 
Uh, bad experiences on the fire department getting stuck in buildings. Yeah. It just yeah. kind of turned me off on wearing a, anything over my face anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. So, um, so, you know, we're going to continue with this, try to, um, because a lot of the money, uh, infrastructure money that we're talking about, a lot of this stuff has to be in place so that when the money actually starts hitting, we can have plans there and kind of put us in the forefront of things mm -hmm. and not have to wait and say, you know, well, you know, maybe we'll get some engineering done at this point in time. You know, if we drag our feet too long, we won't have a road any longer mm -hmm. or a part of it anyways. So people won't be complaining that people are speeding up there to get from one end of the town to the other, but because <laughs> they won't be able to, unless they have a boat. So, so okay. Ah, uh, let's see. Next thing. Oh, yeah. RFD. The Jewett property. Yes. People call it Oxford or Keynes. Also known as Oxford. Yeah. Um, Originally, so, I'll Jewett give you a Pickle. brief. It did used to be Jewett Pickle. Those are the old timers. I'm good with it. <laughs> with the... Um, you know, the criteria that you have here seems, I, seems pretty accurate. I was accurate. going to say, I don't, I don't really want to change it. I mean, I okay. support keeping the same one. Yeah, I mean, the goal, the go goal is... Talk if you want. We're selling the... Well, we're looking to RFP or request for proposals to sell the two... Um, well, it's now two lots of property at the old pickle factory uh, that the town owns. We've done engineering on it we got easements for sewer so it's all set we split off a section that somebody may want to buy to do a turnaround for their existing property and then left a good chunk for development and we want economic development in that lot to bring jobs and um, tax revenue to the town so that's the key and then there are criteria that we put out uh, mm -hmm. that we look at so it's not all just about the dollar it's you know um the potential for job retention and creation, the project's uh, potential generation for property taxes, the uh, project's long-term sustainability, um, project's development timetable. We ran into that with New England Natural Bakers. That was just, I don't know, 15 extensions on their purchase and sale, and then it, then it fell, fell apart. So um, ex experience, financial strength, and financial plan of the proposer. Um, compliance with zoning and developmental restrictions, um, overall benefit for the community, um, impact to the town's immediate neighborhood, uh, including but not limited to traffic noise odors generated by the proposed project. Um, and then the proposed, uh, the price offered for the property. So we'll have to, I guess, discuss that a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think these criteria make sense, Casey. Yeah. Do, do you want to add anything to that? Um, so what I was going to say is I was going to structure my request, and that is for three things. The formal vote to dispose of both properties, because what on Andrea Woods at the COG is helping us with this, what Andrea wants is one document that says, okay, here's the vote to dispose of both parcels, parcel one and parcel two. Um, the next piece is, do we want to set a minimum on each parcel? And the last piece is those review, those evaluative criteria that you just named. And those are the same criteria that were utilized in the last sale of the property. It's literally the exact same thing. I, she sent me the last one and this was back in 2018. Um, so those, that's the exact same amount. So the reason she needs those three pieces of information is because that's used in the RFP to sort of determine the best offer that the town could get. Um, and so my question is, is first, will you guys take a vote individually to, or I guess you could take it together, um, but they're two separate parcels. So I was thinking individually, could you take a vote to dispose of those properties? Um, hold on, I'll give you the I, I, We had to, um, we couldn't go be, below the appraisal. Right. Minimum. Well, you, there's, to, there's right. as long as it's an accepted anything. manner, the, the reason she was asking for a minimum is because in the last one, you did a minimum in the last document or the last sale, the minimum was 200,000. Right. 
and it was for the entire piece of property. You've got two parcels. Well, I mean, I thought since we couldn't accept it below the appraisal amount that why would we set a minimum other than that? She well, wants to have something in that document. Well, my minimum would be what's owed on the property. I think it's 358,000. I don't know what it is at the moment, but that's about where it was. Yeah, that's 350 total. Correct, correct. So and so I don't know how you'd want to split that. It. Right, I don't know what that other spot we'd want to get for. I mean, that's really, um, I, I don't know if there's been an assessment on that one specific lot or an appraisal on that one lot. Uh, Jen's got her hand up, but I don't know if she has yes. that answer. Go, go ahead, Jen. Yes, both of the lots were, we had an appraisal done separately for each of those oh, lots. Oh, good. Okay, good. I'm going to look at that then. And what was the total? I don't have it with me. Okay, because I don't remember seeing it. I mean, I don't Yeah, remember. we had two separate. I can dig it up while you guys are talking. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we can change it before the RFP goes out to what the min our minimum bid would be other than the maybe 200, right? Yes, but the RFP needs to go out relatively soon because we're already starting to market the property. We had a deadline to get um, a piece of marketing material into Business West this morning, which I told Andrea to go ahead and do because I want to get as much mileage out of- what We, we, we want to support that. We want to support that. So, right. so um, the uh, RFP document needs to be finished in time for certain um, notifications to hit. We have to do- why don't, why don't we um, move forward and come back to this after Jennifer spends the money? Well, I found it. Oh, you found yep. the appraisal? Okay. Well, the, I, I know what the, uh, you know, the large lot is valued at 360 and the small lot's valued as is market of 50,000. Okay, so. So those would be the minimums because, I mean, for me, that covers what we owe on them, I think. It, so. it covers what we owe, but it's also the appraised value, which legally right. we can't take less. Than right. And I, value, I'd like so. to see more than that if possible. I mean, we got, but, yeah, but that's so, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, I'm good with that. So we can amend it to have, put those values there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I, I would make a motion then to sell both parcels for the minimum amount of 100, I mean, 360,000 and 50,000. Uh, I'll second that motion. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? Okay, um, I just, well, how much money have we expended on surveying and everything else, Casey? I don't have the total in front of me. Okay. Okay, and well, anyways. I've just. So yeah, it's between five and 10. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, Over the last, any further discussion? The last year. No. All those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Aye, Dave Wolfram. So then you want a, a separate motion to for the to have the same evaluation criteria casey if, if that's what you wanted as so i would say a motion to approve the evaluative criteria as presented yes i would uh, make a motion i i'll just read it so it's clear i make a motion that um the project's potential for job retention and creation the, um, be evaluated the project's potential for generation of property taxes be evaluated the project's long-term sustainability um, be evaluated and the project's development timetable be eva avail um, evaluated experience financial st um, strength and financial planning of the proposer be evaluated compliance with zoning and development restrictions be evaluated overall benefit to the community be evaluated impact in immediate neighborhood including but not limited to traffic noise odors generated by the proposed project be um, evaluated as well. So I'll second that. I, yeah. I think those are, we worked really hard to come up with um, mm -hmm. good criteria and I would like to maintain that criteria. Yep, I agree. Yep, I would second that for sure. Any Aye. further discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye, Aye. Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Aye, Dave Wolfram. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, sewer abatement policy. Uh, we still haven't got a uh, anything back from Lisa on this, right? Uh, sorry. No, we, we haven't sent gotten, it on um, yet. Yeah, we sent it on to her. I haven't gotten. Oh, we did. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah I okay. talked. Um, 
Yeah, but, uh, I, the question I had, Trevor, what if someone doesn't have a summer? I mean, to have doesn't have. So a yeah, great, great. Usage. I have, I have. A, we have an issue right now where you know, as as the um, as the condos come on and stuff, they have one uh, month's usage and then you know get a bill for water usage, but don't have that history. So talking with Barb today, um, what we would do is take that one month, we'd multiply it out six times you know so get your get your half a year usage so that would be your 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 usage rate um you know if they don't have any usage you know we'll have to deal with that when we come on a per case basis that's why that policy allows it's really worded as a one-time exemption um for a lot of these things are like unforeseen issues so on um when people just get a get a uh, a meter and they have one month of winter usage we then multiply that by six and that'll give us an idea okay. of what that is sure. and then they wouldn't go over 125 percent of that usage for the for the summer usage because we know again people water the lawns and all that kind of thing so but what if they only have summer usage Remember, there's no, no abatement yeah there's no abatement i mean okay. it really is uh because we, we we wouldn't know at that point i mean people are, moving in are, they have to and each time unless it's like something you know they had a pipe break or there's something substantial you have to talk about but you know people you know moving in have to be aware of what they're buying and where they're buying and what the rules are so yeah um, because like our last meeting we had the abatement and the water district verified that they had a broken pipe yep Oh, so, I don't yeah. have a problem with the, yeah. the pipeline. But if they, if they have no... In the summer and yeah. have this giant water bill. Yeah, I mean, okay. generally they have to look... And we look at it. I mean, we're fair. We want to look at it. And we want to be fair not only to that person, to everybody else and all the other work that we're doing at the, at the sewer treatment plant. So I'm, I'm reasonable. I mean, if somebody has a yeah. case, um, we'll look at that. But, but generally, I think usually they'll have at least one month's usage. And that's where this client had one use. And so we will extrapolate that out six months and then kind of come okay. up with a number mm -hmm. and it'll wash out the following year. I mean, it tends to, okay. you know, work its I, way out. I just out. want to make sure we're being fair yep. yeah. and, it, and that we're picking up that problem. Yes, yes, that was a it is, it is it a problem. You see, has yeah. your hand up. Hey. So Trevor, could you circle back around with me on that? So if there's something yes, you I to add I, to this. Yeah, I copied that to you. Yeah, my response to the, person and Barb, but um, yes, I will reply back to you on that for sure. It's hard to catch every <laughs> every situation, you know? Exactly. But, so but maybe have you do the best you can. example could help that if we put an example yes. of how we might deal with a problem into the policy. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> yep, that works. Good. Okay. Uh, next thing on our agenda is see. Select board priorities. Um, yeah, actually, we have the open space. What um, we have the open space contract that we have to um, with FERCOG. The open so space. yeah, I don't see that anywhere. Is that? It's, oh. it's actually between the mail and this um, priorities minutes that oh. I gave you guys. No, okay. Yeah. So what do we got? That. Yeah. So this, this relates to the open space and rec plan. Um, we had talked to Kimberly Milk McPhee and I had talked about getting this started. And so finance committee was willing to work with us and oh. allow the beginning of it to start with a transfer. But we the contract um, got lost in the shuffle because Kimberly and I were not talking in the same direction. So what I had asked her for was the contract, which is before you, um, but it's actually I have a two part question here. So the contract is, has three funding sources, $5,000, which was approved by the finance committee and a transfer for FY21 that will be encumbered because this project actually started, our conversations and work started back in April, I think. Um, and then 10,000 for FY22 and 10,000 in DLTA funds from the COG. So it's a $25,000 contract. So I wanted the board to just review that. It's, it's really to do the update on the OSRP plan, which requires the committee to do some work and really needs some shepherding from in 
terms of planning assistance from the COG because the process is very strict. And I actually have worked with the COG on this up in Ashfield. So this process, we actually, usually it takes two years. We, Kimberly and I have both sort of pushed it back to about a year and a half. So the contract, you'll notice the contract end date is December of 2022 because we're behind the eight ball as we discovered earlier this year. Our, con our OSRP plan expired in February. So we're trying to catch up. So we sort of shortened our time frame. Um, but really what I, I want the board to understand is this is an example of us, of me not being able to move forward with something because I didn't have contract authorizations to sign. So I'd like the board to, if, if possible, give me the authorization to sign this contract so we can keep it moving. But following up, it would be helpful if the board would provide an authorization vote so that I can sign contracts for up to $25,000 so that we can facilitate some of these operational needs as they, as they sort of flesh themselves out. Because sometimes that happens and we have to wait two weeks to do contract information sessions with you all. Most of the time I send this stuff out, this actually happened in the last finalizing some of that information between Kimberly and I actually, ha it actually happened 24 hours ago. We were still talking around five o'clock yesterday. So um, it just, it, there's a contract monitoring too that goes on. I think I mentioned it earlier is we make sure the funding sources are set. We make sure that um, there's review of the contract. We make sure that we're coordinating the function of the payables and all that stuff. So it's kind of an administrative process as well as a, a, a functional contract signatory process. To make sure, having been chair of the open space plans uh, renewals a couple of times in the past, um, it's really critical that the planning board and the conservation commission be involved in this. And so I would like, um, you know, us to um, approve this. I mean, I, I don't want to hold it up. So we would approve this um, and, and and allow you to sign sign for um, you know be authorized to sign. But um, I'd really like you to check in with the planning board and the conservation commission on this. You know, subject to their input, or well, at least so know what, what they're going on. Yeah, so the way we did it in Ashfield was we actually, once we had this contract signed, the OSRP group, so the committee itself, reached out to the other boards and said, hey, we need you to participate in this. Can you put somebody, can you delegate somebody from your committee to work with us? And it encompasses more than planning and um, it-, it what I know, I but heard? it's not, it should not go forward without planning board and Conservation Commission input on it. Uh, that's all I know. I'm saying. So you get a working group together is where I was going right. with it, Carolyn. It has to be a working group because each one of those committees needs to have a member that participates in the development of the update. We had eight people on the committee in Ashfield. Well, it was I, a subcommittee. Yeah, well, there's usually, I mean, I would just say that we, a couple from the Planning Board and a couple from the Conservation Commission would be very helpful. You also unless, need people I don't like know how EMD. Is it, you, um, you need unless, more than it's it's much more encompassing than it used to be. I know, I know. That's why I think it's important that you have more than just one person because it you need to make sure that the planning board and the conservation commission are on board with it. That's all. And so what we would do is get some assistance to facilitate some of that with Kimberly and her staff because they understand how to pull those things together. Pull everybody to that table. Annalie, basically, I'm saying please have some input on this. Okay, thank okay. you. Sorry, Annalie. Any comments, Trevor? Uh, nope. Nope. It's a lot of work. Yeah. It's a lot of work. Um, so I'll make a motion to approve or authorize Casey to move forward with this. Um, with input from the Conservation Commission and the Planning Board. I'll second the motion. Chair McDaniel. 
Okay, uh, any further discussion? Okay, um, so the authorization for you signing on the 25,000, that'd be a separate vote, Casey? Do, yes. Or is, is that? Is it a separate vote? Is it needed? Huh? Yeah, uh, it would. I would want you guys to do this in a manner that allows me to handle other okay. contracts that come up like this. This isn't the first time it's happened. But is it? Is it something that, um, I mean, are we, are we that lax that we wouldn't be able to see that and get it to you in time for signatures or, I mean, not it's that not I don't. It's not so much a lax thing, it's a timing thing. In like a couple of weeks? Sometimes um, it needs to happen faster than that, Trevor. That's what I mean. There are, there are times where we have to execute a contract like that in order to keep a process moving. That's the reason I'm asking. And so just to flesh this out a bit, contract management is one of those things that they make us do in our procurement studies. And it has its own separate training session. We, we talk about it at every training session we do for procurement, but it actually has its own separate training session. And one of the things that, that we do is we figure out how we're supposed to be monitoring all the various things that come into a contract from funding sources to actually looking at the terms and making sure the terms are being adhered to. Oftentimes we have technical assistance on big contracts, but for smaller contracts, that's not always the case. So from this perspective, it get, it's a twofold thing. It allows us to proceed with contracts that we need to get done um, in, a, in a fashion that if you have to turn an emergency around and you might have to hold an emergency meeting in order to turn a contract around for $10,000. That's one of those things that I think is an operational thing, not necessarily, you know, if it's a $250,000 contract, that's a different story. No, but I, a I, functional contract from zero to 225,000 is operations related. I get, I get that. I just want to have knowledge of what they are and when, when they're being done. So I'm happy to have, give the authorization to sign just, just so that I know what, what the contract is and it's like brought up at the next meeting. Maybe you say, this is the contract we signed is what we're going forward with. Just so we have an idea of what we're doing. That's all. I don't, I just like, you know, I sign the warrants every two weeks. So I just like to know what they're, what they are as all. So um, I'm good with that. Yeah. The, uh, you know, here again, it was communication. That's all. Um, yeah. The other thing, though, is um, I just want to make sure we're the authorization does not go to town administrator. It goes to you because you are the procurement officer for the town of Deerfield, mm -hmm. and so, which is which is a certain certification, right? Uh, so we want to make sure whoever is signing is the procurement officer for the town of Deerfield. So for purposes of right now, that is me because you all, I have the certification and I've been recertified. And right. a few months ago, I had you do the delegation of CPO, yeah. Chief Procurement Officer. So I cover both those things. Um, right. I would say that the town administrator's job description includes procurement. So, you know, moving forward with the next town administrator, this is something that I would if it was me, I would revisit, and most town administrators would have you have this discussion again. Um, so, you know, that's that's a very good point. Most of the time, it becomes that issue where we have to just coordinate, share information, be aware of of the background. But for purposes of this, I just happen to be the person that that serves in that dual role. Okay. So. You could craft the vote to be that way. We have a motion and a second? Yes. Okay. We have a motion and a second on this contract, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. So um, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Aye, Dave Wolfram. I will make a motion to allow our chief uh, um, procurement officer, Casey Warren, and town administrator be authorized to sign contracts um, up to $25,000. I'll second that. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Aye, Dave Wolfram. Okay. So 
now priorities? Yes. Okay. So um, as some of you are aware, we met on Sunday, uh, went over, well, tried to review priorities for the town of Deerfield. The list is long and tiresome um, it, because there's a lot of things that we want to do and try to get done in town. And it's, to say the least, it's a challenge. So, um, you know, the uh, obviously right now, the highest priority is our sewer system. Uh, so, which is a costly. And, you know, some of the other events that are happening up in Old Deerfield between Pine Nook and mm -hmm. the main trunk line, uh, which Deerfield Academy graciously uh, decided to pay for. Mm -hmm. So, um, but those right now are kind of the highest priority that we came up with. Um, the next one is kind of the vision for the town of Deerfield, or um, more specifically, the South Deerfield Center. And to make it more economic friendly, economic yeah. development friendly, attractive. I was going to say less ghetto, but <laughs> um, it's there's aspects of it that you know. Uh, I was in the com building commissioner's office this morning when the Cumberland Farms actually contacted him Wait, and wanted to know what permit they needed to have to remove the tanks oh, and the goodness. canopy and stuff. Thank God. Wow. Yeah. So so they just have the demolition permit and be off and running. So that'll be great. So that was actually the contractor from that was hired by Cumberland Farms. So. Oh good. good so good. uh so as long as they don't leave a big pile of dirt there, uh, right. that'll be fine. Yeah. But um so you know that'll be one small step forward. Mm -hmm. Um you know, uh, Casey's uh, working on a meeting uh, with Jeff and I from um, Berkshire Design. Berkshire. Of course, you're all welcome to be there. Yeah. Um, we we can nail down a time, but just to kind of do uh, a big overview of what what our projects are and try to get some sort of idea on what we can do. I think it should be a, a regular meeting. Yeah. Hmm. Only because um, this encompasses so much. It pulls everything together. And, it, it. and it should be like that one topic meeting. Yeah. Right, because trying to fit it in with fifteen I, other items. I, um, one one thing that um, Casey that you didn't list of mine, and I think it was because it was came off. It wasn't on the copy, you know, when I copied it on the copy machine. Mosquitoes? No, <laughs> she made she did say mosquitoes, <laughs> but it was the debt ceiling training. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Could we um, get Dor? Maybe Brenda could just reach out to Dor or something. You can ask her. Who, who we should invite here to do um, just a little mini information night on debt ceiling. Cause you know, all the years that I've been select board and involved in the town, you know, we haven't had significant debt and I really don't know all the ins and outs and how to, you know, handle it. And I, I, I just don't feel comfortable. So yeah. No, it's always good to have more training. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah. No so, doubt. If we could get somebody, I know we're not going to get Sean Cronin because he's like the big cheese now, but somebody like him that is very will explain it and and be willing to answer our questions uh, would be very helpful. Okay. Um, and if Sean wants to come out, I mean, we'd love to have him, but I, you know, now he, he's really hard to get. Tim has his hand raised. Tim? Um, I just wanted to follow up on a, something that David Wolfram mentioned about uh, the Cumberland Farms. Um, has anybody probed to find out if there's been any leaks in those tanks? And if so, it's possible to clean up. Can, can you say that again? We couldn't quite hear. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I, Dave Wolfram mentioned that uh, some work is going to be done about removing gas tanks uh, under the the old is that the old uh, uh, Cumberland Farms, and I was just wondering if any probes had been done to determine whether there's any uh, pollution down there from leaking tanks or anything, and if so, who's responsible? Oh, they would be responsible, Tim. They have to do a 21E. Kevin yeah. has his hand ha hand raised. Yeah, actually, it's the fire department that does that, right? Yeah, Kevin. Kevin? 
Um, there has been test wells all the way around those um, tanks for probably the past 15 years. They're monitoring wells is what they are. I believe they had an issue at one point in time um, and that is why they were required to have those, but they are monitoring wells all the way around. And my understanding is, is they have been checking them yearly because it, it's part it's part of their, their beta root system. So if there's a leak, it goes into in that one of the one of the sensors. But the fire department oversees the removal. I mean, the whole step so that if there's any um, soil that is um, contaminated, it's identified immediately. So long as they can identify it, that is correct. If not, then you have to have, if there's any question, you have to have a soil engineer there because the fire department is not qualified to be able to distinguish what is contaminated soil or what isn't. If it's something that there smells, some then somebody, if, if, there, if there's a smell to it, then the fire department then brings in somebody else as a peer review. Right, right. but I, I wanted to just assure Tim that there is somebody that is looking out for our you know our side of things when when it is happening there's someone on site okay you want um, to say something else uh no i just want to that's that's great because um uh, a family on north main street just had a problem with the leaking tank and and it cost them one hundred and ten thousand dollars to resolve the problem so, oh my gosh! Um, I just okay. was concerned that the town. I, I, I assume the town was monitoring this properly. So I just wanted to bring that up. So thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. That's awful. So um, the list of priorities that we came up with, and this is in not any particular order. It's just a list. Uh, as I said, the sewer was phase one of two, pipe replacement, Pine Oak Road, visioning of the South Deerfield Center, outreach, outreach social worker, NRCS and impacts on River Road, ARPA, planning zoning support, building plans, senior housing, Deerfield 2030, the 350th celebration, uh, schools funding and impacts on our, of zip codes, um, additional staff that may be incurred there, the land projects, uh, the common Leary lot, complete streets, leader lot, etc. Zoning bylaw changes, grant fiscal year project wrap up, FERCOG, CPHS contracts, staff duties, responsibilities, and bandwidth. Um, I know uh, one of the things on the um, the Leary lot is um, leader uh, lumber is being sold, and the new potential owner of that is asking if we could do a land swap of uh, fifty feet. I think it is. Well, that's what we were hoping. Yeah, um, that's what we uh, well, years years ago. Remember, we were yeah, talking and about basically that. it's. Yeah. Um, right now, the town owns a small parcel where the old uh, train uh, depot used to be. Um, and so they want that area for the parking, and they want to swap that with land that they currently own, the old 40-year property. And I think, yeah, that old 40-year property was taken down. The house was taken down. And, and, and we have talked about developing the Leary lot so that we could get a, a road through and have a one way kind of coming over by by Cheslicks and loop around and come out onto Elm Street or vice versa. Um, but after they combine when they purchase the property that old house property and the Leary lot automatically get combined all that is left is 50 feet. Hence, we were trying to get a 50 foot um, thing through the town meeting, um, but weren't available. So now we don't have that ability to um, to get a road through there. Um, it was kind of you know classic example of what we we're what we we're hoping to get done at town meeting. Um, so there is some discussion I had with the previous owner about swapping some land there so we could get access through there, you know, from his property, and then maybe we could give over some of the other property, and then also develop so Berkshire Brew could maybe have a more green area to have a outdoor brew 
area brew pub kind of thing that they're doing in the parking lot now if they could swap it to the other side of the building and we could help um, businesses around elm street develop the back side or have better parking and places for picnic tables that kind of thing so that's the whole idea of kind of getting that done and it, we want to have that a little bit more conversation with the new owners i think hamshaw's uh lumber has bought it yeah and um but we got to figure out how to get through 50 feet <laughs> so yeah that's, that's the hard part and you know i've actually talked to a number of people in town since the town meeting and they're under the misconception that when we were going for this municipal variants they thought as a board of selectmen we could just say we're going to do it mm. and i said no that's not the case you know we still have to go through site plan uh if there's a, there's a uh, zoning board of appeals and the bottom line is before we can do anything that has to go to town meeting and planning board yep so you know there's all these steps there that have to be done it's not just the three of us saying okay we're going to do this and it's done uh it's we have to go through all the same hoops that everybody else is mm -hmm. and it's just you know we're just asking for the latitude for some things that maybe we could get you know a little narrower area or something um it wasn't because you know the Leary lot was the thing that we were thinking about you know the senior housing possibility on braver road we're thinking about uh we were thinking about cumberland farms in the center of town uh, there was a number of things that were going through our heads mm -hmm. and here again none of this was something that would have been just thrown down the townspeople's throat yeah this is something that had to go through the planning board to start with you know site plan review it has to be done uh, get input from that. Uh, and then, you know, everything else. And, and here again, the bottom line is even after all that, it has to go to town meeting. Right. Casey so, has her hand up. What's that? Casey. Casey. So to your point, David, there's also an element of fiscal planning involved here. And that is a significant process through capital finance. So the steps, and I give Annalie credit, she mentioned all of this at one point, and it was in the annual town meeting guide, is the steps to get something done that's a land use project, no matter what the municipal facilities allowance would have given us, still is pretty comprehensive. And that misapprehension really um, tells me people weren't listening because we did mention that and i thank annalee for making sure it was reiterated but yeah. it sounds like that it just didn't get across one of those things that we've all encountered since we've been involved with town meetings they were read the first two lines and they stop and that's it and they're judging all their opinion on those first two lines without the page and a half or two pages in some cases we had three or four pages of things um but it's one of the idiosyncrasies of town government mm -hmm. so but, so um so the other item is um outreach social worker right yes i mentioned that yeah oh you did yeah. yeah um so um i still need some information so i um i support you know do doing something in this this realm um I worry that we I just found out Casey um, found out that, um, that there, we have the, the SIG grant for one more year. Right. So it's wrong. There is some funding. But what's oh. that? Casey? I was wrong. Oh, I you thought some I of it wrong. got spent. I'm sorry. Right. No, I know. no, no. That's fine, Casey. No, that's we just got to make sure the money's there. But I'm, I'm also like I, I'm concerned about. Well, a couple of things. I'm concerned about tying it to that grant and that funding. I think if we want to support this thing, we should fund it and then we should make it sustainable. And um, I talked to Allie a bit today. I think Allie's, Allison's online. Um, she was going to kind of chime in as well. Oh, um, yes, I think she she's is. here. I, I should text her because she's probably, you know, doing other things. Yeah. She's like, oh, Annie's she is here. Oh, good. Thank you. And, and uh, Annie's here too. Uh, and wonderful. That's great. So I think um, I really wanted to have, we could have that discussion now if you wanted, or set a meeting to kind of talk about it well, specifically. Well, you know what, Trevor, I, I had, Casey and I had a discussion already this, okay. this, yeah, go ahead. this morning that I think started, uh, maybe you can summarize it better than I can, Casey, but it started the discussion. Um, so I was relieved that we had the $13,000 for the SIG grant. 
um, still for this year. However, that money is is only thirteen thousand dollars, right? And that's not enough. Yep. And that person is going to do a specific part of the job. So maybe Casey, you can talk about it because we had a. I felt like we had a really good conversation. I had a good conversation with Annie last night. So let's try to summarize what Annie and I talked about, what Casey and I talked about, and what you and Allie talked about. Okay? Yes. So that can we I? can pull Dave in. Yep. But then also try to get some synergy here as to how this is going to be formed because I think there's there's two different jobs. Right. Exactly. And I'm concerned about. So I I just want to say like social worker versus community health care worker and outreach no, outreach coordinator, outreach coordinator. Yeah. Outreach coordinator. well no no let me say no community health care worker because okay I, I part of me wants to leave the senior center outreach person alone it's used on three different towns that are controlled by you know that money is set for the senior center for that specific use and those seniors in three other towns not deerfield and th those two other towns are not really involved with our, you know, with our health care. So, yeah, but once we start being able to build. Well, that, we'll get to that. But just yeah. let, let me, I'm just saying, if we can leave that alone and, f and, f and maybe we tie it in eventually, I'm not opposed to that. I'm just saying, leave that funding alone for that, for that department and for servicing the seniors of those three towns. Let's look at funding this position and make it sustainable. And I get that, you know, I talked a little bit with Allie today about how we bill and billing is changing immensely in, in the whole industry. And she'll be able to explain this better than, than I am. But um, I just think we have enough funding right now to get the ball rolling with, I know this is a pain for documenting. We have to be careful how we do the ARPA money, but we have enough money if we truly think this is a need, and I hear from the public, and I thank the public for their letters, I really I was just going to say the letters have been very it helps it, informative. I, helps I, a ton. It, yeah. it, 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 I just want people to know that the letters have been really informative mm -hmm. and helpful for me to understand the need. The need. Well, that and that's what I'm wondering at. Look, so there's difference between, and I think really we need to boil down the difference between a social worker and a, and a community outreach person or a community healthcare person. I think Allie might be able to weigh in on this a little bit. I think that um, we have to really figure out what the problem that we're trying to solve and which position is really needed. So if, if it's a community healthcare person, I think Allie's team is set up to deal with that. If it's a social worker, maybe not. And I don't want to speak for for Ali, but this, that's, I, I really want to understand the need we're going to after to fix. How, what are the deliverables for that person? And I think we can find the money to really support that position and then figure out how we support it long term. Because, you know, we, we provide health care for our seniors or, or for our community with a, with a nurse, do for cog, do a thing. Well, and I think that the. Can we just back up on that yep. a little bit? Because. Um, like when Lisa goes out and does the home visits for the shots, she mm -hmm. bills insurance. When she sees people in here, she doesn't bill. And, and it is, you know, anybody that comes from the senior center, which potentially is yep. all three times. So what I was thinking to do is that we need to be billing, you know, for all the services, if potential is there to be billed, because it's already set up. I mean, they built for the insurance for, um, you know, like our flu shots and all that kind of stuff. And so that would help us maybe get more because the FERCOG is, has more nursing under this grant. Mm -hmm. And so we should be getting more hours somehow, which shouldn't cost us anything because it's covered by this giant grant for three years and then renewable for two, two years after that. We talked about that so, too. So, so what we need to do is figure out if we if we set up you know like the park already has the billing the insurance billing then we should be able to do that with a social worker so ultimately what we're spending isn't going to be any more than what we're already spending okay. if, if i think no I, I get that too i think that the billing is the hard part of trying to figure that out because that is changing a lot Al, ali are you are you oh she's yeah, got a hand up 
Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Do you <laughs> Bail want, me out. Do you want me to just because I'm, I'm happy to sh share any of my information and just be a resource. Um, but I also don't want to dominate a conversation that um, I don't belong in. So let me know. We need um, help. Yeah. Can you all hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just for just for context, I, I'm on the finance committee, but my other hat, it, my day job is the um, CEO for the Community Health Center of Franklin County. So that's a nonprofit primary care health care health care organization. Um, and uh, I, I, with the conversation, I've had a couple of preliminary talks just with Casey, with Trevor, and with Carolyn, all at different times. And I've sort of pinned down a couple different kind of questions to ask. And the first is exactly what problem do we want to solve? Because I think there's a lot of problems that we could choose to solve with a, a you know, a social worker or a community health worker. Um, and I think determining exactly what we want to accomplish would be the first step that, I, that I'd recommend. Um, a community health worker would be somebody who's really focused on social determinants of health and really helping connect people to resources that they might need. Um, a social worker would be somebody who is maybe more able to provide potentially crisis work, crisis intervention work, or it could be... Um, an actual healthcare service directly provided. Um, a community health worker can do some of that, but not to the same level as a social worker. So, so there's some different sort of levels in there. And I think knowing what the problem is we wanna solve is gonna be really key to figuring out the, the best direction to go. And there could be other options too. So I'm just really speaking from my own knowledge. Um, so yeah, I would say th those are sort of the first the first step is to figure out what's the what's the problem and yeah. Let, let me let me um, just summarize what I see as the problem, and um, and then how then maybe you can fill in what you think is the best approach. The the problem I ha see is we we ha now have emergency care service sort of kind of level mm -hmm. with the CSO and the police department. So say someone's suicidal, they they intervene, they save that person that day or that evening, whatever. But then what happens next two weeks from now? So what I'm looking for is someone that we have that could be the resource for a follow-up and we'll work with our police department and the CSO person so this, this person who was suicidal two weeks ago, at least is having some follow-up and is not gonna be, you know, have another opportunity to, you know, that we have to respond and maybe be successful or whatever. So there's some follow-up, more preventative and more primary care kind of person. And then we also have, what we've been trying to do is, is do this outreach to the seniors who, um, you know, there's so many programs now available for seniors. And I mean, just even signing up for Medicare is confusing for people. And so I feel like we need a social service coordinator person to answer questions and to help navigate what is available to our seniors who, who you know, it is confusing. And they, they might need just an, a, a good reference or a good um, resource. But then also, this person is aware that, I mean, you know, we've been through a pandemic for a year and that this person is looking for services maybe, but, oh my gosh, they're depressed or they're, you know, isolated and they have problems. And, and, and also as a referral for families who are concerned that, you know, I mean, our police are wonderful. They do well-being checks and we have all kinds of stuff through our police department that are wonderful and triad, but this would be someone else to check. And so I, I see two different things and we, and we do have the outreach grant already through SIG, but it's gonna be, this is it. Yeah. We have to come up with some kind of story for us to continue the services. And from my understanding and talking with Annie, there are, is all kinds of grants out there and working with you as our partner and doing these kind of more services 
then number one, some of these services are billable and they'll be reimbursable to us to cover staff, but also we have the opportunity then to get grants and, and, and bring more services to our town. And, and again, I feel like it's, this is all ages involved, not just seniors, not just kids in school, but we have a widespread need, I think, that I've seen in this past year because of the pandemic. And I, I, I feel, I, I mean, it's anecdotal. I have no background in it, but I, I feel very strongly that we need to support this. So maybe. And I also feel like, the, so, and what we're, when we're talking about billing and stuff, we're not talking about a Deerfield employee or a Deerfield billing to get money back. It's it, if we partnered with say Allie's firm or another firm, you know, we're not picking, we're just saying if we community health service. community health center or, or anybody else that we partnered with for this, this care and this help, it's, it's them figuring out the billing. It's them making sure it's uh, sustainable. It's um, it's us really just like we do to FERCOG right now, we send, uh, you know, we pay a certain amount of money a year to have healthcare services, nursing services for our people, seniors or anybody can access it, but typically seniors do. Um, we want to also Allie have that same, hand raised when you have a same, okay, and that same support. Go ahead, Allie. Um, yeah, so when when it comes to billing, um, and and just to, just to comment on what you were both saying, um, I think a, a partnership with an organ a partner organization would make a lot of sense for the town. Um, I don't really I, the community health center would be happy to be a partner, but we also don't have to be. CSO could be an option. Behavioral health network. There's like a lot of different options, and I'd be happy to you know connect the select board to any any of those that might fit best to serve the specific need when it comes to billing. I would, this would be the only place I, I have a really strong recommendation. I would highly recommend the town not directly employ and try to bill directly for any of those services because it is going to get really complicated. Yep. Um, no, we went. And then the other piece about billing is I think realistically a role like this, and I don't have numbers or, or data with me to back this up, but I think a role like this really is not going to be I don't think any um, billing revenues are going to totally cover the cost of the role. Um, and depending on the, the exact type of person, you know, a social worker is going to be able to bill for more of their services. A community health worker probably won't get any back at all, at least not this year. There's state legislative changes in process that might facilitate that in the future. Um, but, but realistically, I, I wouldn't count on billing revenues to support this. I, I do think it's a worthy endeavor. And like I said, I don't have town of Deerfield data, but I do know that you, there's a lot of need for connection to all kinds of resources, healthcare resources, um, social services, uh, things like that, me, you know, mental health care. It, and so whatever portion of that, you know, you guys are seeing in, in Deerfield, um, I think fo focusing on that makes a lot of sense. Partnering with an organization would make a lot of sense, but I would, I would plan for it to be grant funded at least in the, you know, for the first section of time, you know, and enough time that a, that a person would be willing to do the work without firm funding after the grant ran out. Right. Yeah. And, you know, Unfortunately, I've had a fairly checkered past on some things. And, you know, to me, it's not right now, it's not about the money. It's about taking care of the town of Deerfield. Uh, I'll give you an example. I had a gentleman that I was dealing with that when was going through a crisis, attempted suicide, talked him down. He settled down tried to get extended care for him. They said they didn't have time for him. A week later, he put five bullets into his wife and then took his own life. Oh my gosh. So um, this is very personal to me that, you know, um, you know, I was fortunate when I was a Deerfield police officer. Uh, Dave Johnson had just moved into town. When I had crisis intervention, I called Dave and he'd come out, no charge. He'd come out and help me. Um, 
you know, because there was no system back in the, those days. So it's, um, you know, we have to look at the well being for the town of Deerfield. And with COVID and everything else, it's Life is caused a lot of problems. And a lot of those problems, unfortunately, are under the surface. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the scenario of the duck, you know, looks very calm going across there, but he's pedaling like hell underneath. You don't see yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so. Annie, one of the things that Annie said last night was that um, she was very appreciative of the community health service group because you're smaller and could work on a more personal level. So I don't. Annie, really could you come it. up and just share your thoughts on this as well? And Annalee? Can you hear me? Okay. So I'm actually, for some of the folks at home, I'm part of a group of um, citizens who actually brought this idea forth. We did a ton of research. We've actually met with three, three other town social workers. Um, so this is a model that's used in other areas. Um, and we can share a little bit about that, but ultimately I'm a social worker. A lot of the folks who worked on this are social workers. Anna Lee worked on it. She's a nurse and we're seeing a huge need in the community. I appreciate the story that you just shared, Dave. I think we all, after this year, especially, it's been so difficult um, and the community is hurting. And we think that this could really, really, really help. And it's even I, it was like music to my ears to hear that maybe you would consider making it its own because we really feel like even, you know, 20 hours just dedicated to this, you're going to collect data and you're going to see it's a huge need right. um, but, and yeah. it won't go wasted. And even if we can only recoup, you know, 15% initially out of billing, um, I think the community, we need to start taking care of our community. Um, and I know we do a, we do our best on a shoestring budget, but for a very low cost, we could literally save lives. And it seems like a no brainer to mm -hmm. us. So, um, oh, go ahead. Uh, and then I'll have a question. And it also has um, some other national data. And I really appreciate the desire for more local data. Uh, that's really your fiduciary responsibility as you're looking at any, any funds. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's caught in a catch-22 there because we want data. We need to hire someone to collect the data but we can't hire someone to collect the data until yeah, we, we have, have data. the data, <laughs> right? So I think as, um, I think I'm hearing here to some degree is having a, um, a moment of faith that um, recognizing that um, there are people out there who are hurting as, as you were mentioning the letters that have come forward. It's amazing how much social workers in town have been uh, just turning people away because right. they're not able to care for people. I, our school resource officer I know is very, very busy working mm -hmm. with things. And um, so if we could in fact allocate the money to at least get started so we can start collecting not only the data but also data that then could go towards grants mm -hmm. because there are grants that then could in fact be um, other funding opportunities. Yeah. Actually, just before, before we move on, just, just to catch what you just said, um, our school resource officer has a lot of data and a lot of information yeah. and, and has a real good relationship with a lot of the kids. And I, you know, if we could capture somehow, if we could capture some of that, that would, I think, give us some baseline. Um, yeah, and we know at least, and maybe some folks have seen the news reports, but I think what was most striking to me was at one point, Bay State Children's Hospital was full at the height of the pandemic, but it wasn't because of COVID. It was because of mental health. Wow issues, suicidality, danger to themselves and others. So I, that was, that's in Western Mass. And those yeah. are the hospitals that our community uses. Um, so it's, it's here. And I think another really important thing to remember is, I think we reviewed this study by Johns Hopkins University that was warning communities that, hey, when the pandemic is over, we should treat it like a natural disaster. And what we know from natural disasters is there's a honeymoon period where people are okay, and then there's a huge uptick in suicides. Yeah. Um, so it's sure. it's very possible that's sort of where we're headed. And wouldn't it be a little bit better if we had 
a little bit more resources to help handle that in our community. So let me ask the question of um, social work versus a community outreach person or community health care person. Like, look, like, I need to understand, again, as Ali said, what, what problem are we trying to solve? I, I know we could solve, I and mean, we could hire two of them, three yeah. of them, and not address everything we need. So where's the best, you know, who's the best partner? Where's the best uh, bang for our buck to gather the data? Are we looking at a social worker versus a community outreach person? I don't, I'm not in this industry. You want to know about windows and doors, I'll tell you everything you want to know. This is not my area of expertise. Well, this is my area. So. That's why you're sitting here. So I'm so really glad. That, what my that. recommendation would be as a social worker and as someone who works in systems and has more of a macro level level of sort of competence, social workers are trained to be more than just therapists. Um, and they also have license to bill. So social workers can do a lot of the outreach sort of on the ground work, but they have a master's degree um, to apply clinical skills to even do short-term therapy. So what we sort of had envisioned as a group when we looked at what other towns are doing is they have a social worker because they can do all of these other things, including some of the things that community health workers are doing, and they're more able to bill for some of those things. And then um, who do you partner with? I, you know, I don't know, Ali, how do you, um, you know, we talked about this a little bit today. I, yeah, you, I... I can sp speak a little bit to that billing and and I think you could the town could partner with a variety of different organizations. The community health center has a program. We have a couple of different programs where we have an embedded community health worker and that's a, that's a model that works well for, for that we have one in the jail and we have one who's going to be hired into the opioid task force connect program. Um, and then there's um, uh, there's one for our farm worker program. I knew there was another. Um, we don't have existing the same model with social workers, um, like licensed social workers um, that we do with the community health workers, but I don't think the same model couldn't, couldn't work for social workers. The biggest challenge there is I think that the increased cost for the social worker would be offset by any, any billing revenues that you were able to collect. So um, I, if you're, if, it just depends on exactly what the town decides they want for service and then also how much funding the town can, can afford. I think a community health worker would be an easier, faster person to get, to get in place, but there's, there's certainly some things that they wouldn't be as able to do. Um, they can do some of that, but not, not the full scope that a, that a licensed social worker can do. Um, and I, you know, I have my own opinions, but I don't think that they're actually relevant to this conversation. I'm ha happy to share them, but, um, but I, I think it's more appropriate for me to sort of just share my, my understanding of the, the, the systems that we have available and, um, right. And, so and I think, I think you're set up to, um, you know, to partner with us for a community health worker and, and that's kind of that affordability part where, you know, you could match some grant money, we would match some grant money and together we get this person, but. Yeah. So the, the, yeah, the community health center, and I'm, I'm trying to be ca careful here because I do, I am serving in multiple roles and I don't want it, that. Exactly. Show and I want it to be very transparent. I am the of CEO course. of the community health center and Deerfield resident who serves on the Deerfield finance committee. <laughs> Wearing <laughs> a, lot a lot of hats. Of there. It's a little so, tricky. Yeah, yeah, right. And they're not really in conflict with each other, but no. but I definitely have a perspective. The right. community health center, we have our own ARPA funding and I have just dog-eared um, some of that for a um, for like a 50% of a of an FTE community health worker. It's a program we're trying to expand anyway. Um, and I'm imagining partnering with a municipality a police department or a, a senior center or something or the FERCOG. So if the town of Deerfield wanted to partner in that, we're prepared, the health center is, is prepared to do that. But I wanna be very clear that I, I'm not intending to exert any pressure on the town of Deerfield if it isn't the right choice, because I most importantly, I wanna make sure that we're solving the, the actual problems that we see with the tools that are the most appropriate. Um, 
And I think that the select board is going to be the, the group who is more aware of what Deerfield is seeing as their problem and what tool they want. Um, and just to be clear, you're not looking at um, half an FTE for a social worker, right? Because you, yeah, you just don't, you're not set up like that. And, for, and yeah, that's... Yeah. And, and for, for one reason, it's because social workers are harder to hire um, and they are more expensive. Um, and the other reason, which is a health center reason, is just this partnership, we have a model already that works. And so this is the model we are really prepared to expand. Doing it with a social worker would require some significant changes that would need, just need to be worked out. Granted, another organization might be prepared. I mean, that's exactly what CSO is doing. So, so that's feasible as well. That's really what I want to talk about. What are the, what's the problem we're trying to address? Would we address it by that partnership or should we be looking at a different partnership and what kind of dollar amount? I mean, the dollar amount people have been talking about is, you know, that 7,000 because it would add on to the grant part that we had and that would be half of that. But if we're doing a social worker thing, that's a totally different ballpark number. And, you know, uh, not that that matters at all, just, just to be clear on what we're talking about and making sure that we are solving the problem or at least trying to address that problem. And is it better to start with a healthcare worker to start gathering this data or should we jump in for a social worker and how do we fund that? Obviously we have the same pool of money, but it's obviously a larger chunk of money and we have to have conversations with maybe CSO to do that. Are they available? So I just wanted to kind of flush that out a little bit more and understand that. I will, uh, I will just say, I think that based on the people that we've spoken with in the community, including people who work for the town, it would really need to be someone who's qualified to provide a couple of sessions of therapy at the very least, which makes me feel that a community health worker is probably not the right decision yeah. for the need that we're seeing and for the need that folks are writing in about. Right. Would so um, that need be met? Um, by being connected to that, that brief therapy? Directly. So what we're, yeah, what we're seeing, what we're seeing is that because wait times are so long. So yes, we, you know, a social worker could connect to a therapist. There's actually certain programs that, um, towns have invested in. That's like basically like a therapist, um, like phone book where you can hook people up. But what we're finding is because there's such a shortage, in other towns, these um, these social workers will do short term therapy, and sometimes four you know four sessions is enough to get a family through a crisis and on the other side and hooked into a service. But there's this like interim bridge time that's really needed, and especially for kids, which is right. what we've spoken with the high school about that they have this these this cohort of kids who've been waiting for a therapist for five months, and right. in other towns they have social workers who can sort of like manage that temporarily that until bridge. they right so that's the sort of drawback that you might miss out on without having a social worker but if we, that, that we Annie Jen, speaking? yeah that was annie speaking yep thank you um, so if we were um if if we did the health care worker through the community health center and then we went through the social worker through the cso do you feel any that would kind of work to have two different organizations be partnering with us? I, I can speak to that, Carolyn, because oh, sure. yeah, just because I, um, because we already are, have some similar interactions with CSO as an organization. Um, and I, I think that you're going to get the most efficient care for patients or citizens, residents, whatever term we want to use. I think you're going to get the most efficient services if you do things within a single organization because of all of the HIPAA laws and things like that make it really hard to share information. And um, so the, C the CSO, I, there's collaborations that can happen and there's paperwork that can help facilitate those collaborations. Um, if you have everybody within the same organization, there are fewer barriers um, to, to try to cross. Now, I'll also say that for just depending on the type and whether it's chronic or acute type of problems we're seeing for chronic problems, I think the community health center is a great resource because it has 
like just a lot of different services. Um, and a community health worker would be able to directly link to those services. But I think Annie is right that that person might be able to do a, a little bit of counseling, but it wouldn't be that same level of, of therapy immediately. There would be an extra step. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't be interested in doing the social worker, Allie? I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't be interested. I mean, as, and I, I'm not going to say I, the health centers, but I should say wouldn't be interested. I think that it will be much more challenging to execute. So I think it's, it's possible. It's feasible. I can't guarantee it would happen in a speedy manner um, just because of the the hiring environment for that work group and the um, and the cost to provide it and having to build a new a new program rather than extend an existing program. So I would be open to conversations about it. I think there's a lot of logistics in there that probably doesn't belong at a select board meeting, um, but it would be more complicated. That's been a healthy conversation, anyways. At least to kind of get have a discussion of where we're at with you know funding our needs you know different levels of service um it's it's just I do complicated have con a contacts too so if the town does decide that you have a vision you know very specific vision you want to execute and you need contacts let me know because i'm happy to facilitate if, if great possible. thank you I know, um, Annie, you were talking about Stowe. Um, they, uh, they have 15 hours a week for a social worker and um, they, they manage about 130 families on the average a year. Yeah, so Stowe, yep. So they, they pay for it outright. He's a municipal employee. Um, so they, they don't bill. Um, they've just made that decision that they just want this and right. you know it's available. So he works three days a week and they had, he worked with 133 or 35 different referrals. And some of those were multiple sort of follow-up yeah. calls. Some of them were kind of one-off like, Hey, I need help with health insurance. And I have no idea where to start, but yeah. there were several that required, you know, some, some help. Yeah. Um, so, and then what are the ones that, um, that you had talked about that had, um, brought in grant money and were funded by grants. Yeah, so um, we had like a two hour sit down with the Hopkinton social worker. They actually have three people in their office. I realize this is apples and oranges, oh, sure. but yeah. just to sort of give you an idea of like you, you put a little bit of investment and in sort of all other these sort of money can come in. So they just got a $600,000 grant through um, SAMHSA which is the federal, and I always forget, it's Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration mm -hmm. for the federal government. So she spearheaded um, funding for suicide prevention and um, substance abuse prevention programs for their town um, with grant funding. She also, she also has a relationship somehow with the district attorney. So like drug money yep. that they sort of confiscate, they turn over to, to them to do prevention programming with the town. So smart. if you have someone to sort of make those connections in the community, you can bring in some revenue yeah. to pay for things. Um, I, the liability of hiring some a social worker as a town employee, I'm concerned about, but I, uh, but I, I like that flexibility, obviously, but I, um, I, I, I just I feel like a partnership with the entity that is doing this already seems like the first step in the door, you know, trying to I figure out. Would, I think we agree on that. And the, and the reason why I say I think I agree on that is because, number one, we need to establish the program. Mm -hmm. And then we need to establish, you know, sustainability. And partnering with somebody that has experience is much better than doing this ourselves. I mm -hmm. mean, I... Yes, yeah. you know, years of experience oversight, all that. And, and we have too much on our plate already. Mm -hmm. Partnering with somebody that is capable and has good reputation, and that's why I kind of really want to work with Allie. But you know, um, you know, maybe we'll figure something out. But I, I feel like we need to. I, after talking to Annie, it feels like instead of trying to make it be one job description, if we're not going to make it a social worker across the board, then it really is a two person 
two and, entities. Right. And, I, and, and we have to figure out how that works. Yeah. Right. But yeah. I, again, I feel really comfortable with the community health service because I, I feel like they'll make the effort to talk to Brian and get information about the schools. They'll make an effort to talk to Julie of, about what happens at the library every afternoon. And, um, you know, you, you get information from different community sources. We have already the information here. We just have to figure out a way to collect the data and put it together in a package. And, and so, I mean, I would really like to go forward because we, we do have the SIG grant. So I would really like to go forward with the community health worker and then keep this um, social worker thing going so we can sort of keep working on it. Mm -hmm. As a second, oh, you mean that you mean the senior center well, outreach work? I would like or? to keep that separate. I really would. I'd rather fund a full position with ARPA money to do this. The social worker? Well, I'll look at that, but if, if you want to move, so I, I still feel like I need a little bit more time figuring out which is the best move, and maybe both of them are. But, um, well, we have the SIG grant, and we know that we have to apply for additional money next year if we want to keep servicing the seniors. Carolyn, yes, sir. can I interrupt yeah. for a second? Yeah, please. Sure. So we need to get approval to do something like that with the SIG money. Yeah. And I know. before I know. we can do that, we need to nail some other questions down. Allie had sent some questions that I forwarded out to you guys and asked if we could plan a meeting. So we really need to nail down. You guys have had a robust conversation, but without some sort of a plan, it may not work with the SIG money. And to your point, Trevor, in order to attract an outreach person, we need to offer robust, attractive incentive. And we may not be able to do that with just SIG. So I'm, I'm because the, the employment market is very tight right now. We need somebody who's got a real understanding of the connectivity. And one of the things that attracted me to it myself as a person to some of the things that Allie was talking about is the fact that that community person has connectivity to various disciplines and can point people in a direction that they can get some assistance, even if it is going to a social worker. There's that ability to do that, which I think it is a little bit different depending on the, the population, but fundamentally is a resource that could be really useful to help families and seniors. So we would we have to nail down what we're asking SIG to do before we can commit money to it. They may say no. Said we're gonna use it. That's why I'd rather just leave that separate Maybe we tie it in, but at least fund so, it with so the what ARPA. So you're saying is commit to doing the healthcare for the town of Deerfield anyway, and then maybe the, or maybe not we can do SIG money, offset it with SIG money. But right, and have that discussion with Waitley and Sunun, or we just leave that program separate as a outreach for the seniors. Maybe it gets tied in later if, if after a year of figuring this out, but I think we should just wholly fund whatever we're going to fund out of ARPA for, and again, discussion for all to have, but just deal with that separately than trying to take the money from the SIG, because I just would, there's so much baggage that comes along with that, and, and, and we have to really think about the other two towns and what, what the requirements of that SIG grant money are. We could just focus and just fund it if we if we believe in it fund that position with the arpa money and and go that well, route and then and yeah. then it really but then have one more meeting before we do that to really decide is that the route we're going or do, do we want a social worker instead is it at all possible to consider putting aside some of the arpa money as seed money for someone on a professional level who could help pull together all of these questions uh, almost on a consultant basis, potentially even whether or not that would be a social worker who could help you answer those questions. Well, and, and part of the issue is that we're trying to keep the, the ARPA money extremely streamlined because the more you do with it, the more reporting requirements you have. And some towns are hiring another whole person just to do it. And we don't have a ton of money as it is. So 
what we really want to do is with a lot of that ARPA money is to do one infrastructure project because it's a lot less, you know, dealing with the reporting. But I do think that this certainly fits in the intention of I think of this of helping communities out of the out of the crisis that we've been in the pandemic that we're in and we obviously have a need from that and this is money to help with that and I feel like it it, it serves that purpose and I and maybe it is servicing those those two different aspects of that job um, but I just want to think about okay what are the reporting requirements how much work are we creating by doing this um, and just kind of figure that out in the next week or so. I think mm -hmm. it makes sense to do that and really decide on which avenue we're going. And I'm not so, I just think if we're gonna fund it, I'm not really worried about that SIG grant money. I think that is, it's small pitch, money, it's, small money. Yeah. it's for that position and we <coughs> wouldn't have to do all the background work with you know, Emmett's replacement to kind of redirect that. Let's just, if we think this is important, fund this with the ARPA money. Yeah and deal with the reporting of it. Oh, so I the question I have is, Annie, do you have, and Allie, do you have, I hate, I hated being called Davey when I was young. <laughs> so I have a strong habit of dropping the Y off. So I'm tempted to call her Al and you Ann. So <laughs> um, it's just one of those pet peeves I have in my mind with, with the Ys, but, um, do you have the possibility of working together and maybe coming up with a proposal that you could give the town? Yeah, I, I'm happy to meet with anybody who, who is interested. I find that the community health center tends to be like the best kept secret of Franklin County, which is a real shame. Um, <laughs> we're not I, trying I, to Allie, I just want to say that I really agree. And that's why I, I, I no. want us to be one of your partner sometimes. Because we don't yeah. fund marketing very well. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm, no. happy, I'm happy to connect with, with Annie and um, and just share. Like I said, I have my own opinions. I feel like it's inappropriate given especially my dual roles finance. Right. And for me to like share too many of them, I, I'm trying to be more neutral, um, at least. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so yeah. And after, because, you know, sitting here, you know, the two of you getting together and coming through with a proposal, what's best for the town of Deerfield is better than me sitting here thinking what the best proposal is. Yeah, you well, know, I think that's it's you know, I was a cop for 14 years, I was a firefighter for 17 years, I was an EMT for 30 years. I have four daughters. <laughs> I don't have any clue on this stuff. <laughs> well, so I know, I've it's I I have found that the more effort I put into this, the more I don't understand or I'm more aware of how much I need to understand. Yeah, and, and I agree. Um, it's, it's just one of those things that it, it's like a brand new whole new information and no. you have to peel back the onion a bit and figure yeah. out right. what's in yeah. there, and what trying, can you do, and what's I the know, best fit. You know, with my background in insurance, I know we can come up with ways to bill and I know we can be sustainable over time, but how do we set it up so that we take advantage of, of who has information in town already? How do we get the services out immediately? And how do we figure out a way that is sustainable over the long haul? Because I don't think this need is going to go away for any time soon. Yeah. And no, I, I, the world's I, tough spot. So I, I feel a need to make uh, and, and I feel partnerships are really important. And that's, mm -hmm. I want to partner with the community health service because one of the things that I've uh, found in the last 14 months or 18 months of the pandemic is how wonderful the community health center truly is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, I have to say, I didn't really know too much about it. I was like, oh, you work there. That sounds really great, Allie. But honestly, <laughs> I'm, I'm so impressed with the services. We've, you know, the, the people that have had, COVID issues and, and our migrant workers and different ones that we've referred to the um, community health center has been tremendous. I mean, you, either services that you offer are, are just so wonderful. So, and you, and you go out of your way. That's why, I mean, I mean, you feel like every single person up there feels like they care. And that's why, I mean, this is the whole part of, the whole purpose of this is to say that we care so I know that this is a place that I want to send people because you care. So we need to figure this out somehow. 
So it sounds like maybe we can coordinate um, a meeting with our group, with yeah. Allie, and we can sort of give her a little more background on what we've learned the last year sure. looking into this. Mm -hmm. And then she can tell, you know, you what she can tell us a little bit more about the business yeah. end on the models she uses. And right. we can come up with an objective sort of proposal. We have, right. we have the contract for the jail that she had referenced already you know, already as a basis for, mm -hmm. and that's that community health right. worker. But we don't have that other, you know, the next level up mm -hmm. kind of social work. Right. What that cost is, yeah. you know. Right. All and we have, we have some of those figures based on the market rate yeah, that's um, that we've put together. Be helpful. So it feels like we're moving in a good direction and we'll just get more information. And yeah. I might just want to add one, one last piece in response. We'll to give you into Monday. What Carolyn just said. <laughs> I don't think that a public um, public health social worker will ever pay for itself with billing revenues. I think right. the reason you have one is because the revenue isn't there to cover it in a private practice. We're, we're meeting a need that is otherwise unmet. And um, that, that's why um, I, I felt that um, we could same with the base it on the based on the SIG grant we could apply for money because the SIG grant, grant is going away. Yeah. So are. I felt that we could base it yeah. on, if we had a partnership and we had all this stuff, we could build our story and we, and we could apply for grants um, yeah. for yeah, the, in the pot of money that the SIG grant. grant comes out of. Yeah, yeah. build the sustainability on the, on the value to the community and on, on fund, grant funding. And if you're able to recoup any through billing, that's right. Great. That's gravy. But I wouldn't. Yep. I wouldn't count on it for this particular. Correct. Oh, no, we know. Yeah. We know. That's <laughs> good. That was my finance hat. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. The I understand totally. But the social worker part is billable. I know it's billable. So we should be able to offer those services, whether we have a grant or not. So do you need something by your next? Uh... Like or well, here I again, you, you know, I know you folks are probably busier than 100 paper hangers right now. Uh, but you know, as, as soon as we could have it, if there's if at least like if you could have some conversations not, before yeah. the next scheduled meeting, I'm not we, asking for a firm proposal. So, but Allie, maybe, we, we meet on Fridays. I don't know if you're available Friday at one. I will well, be working at the health center, <laughs> so we have a meeting, <laughs> but um, but we can connect. I, I have, I yeah. don't yeah. always contact. Yep. Okay. We'll we'll That's get fine. each other's contact through yeah. somebody here. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Okay. That'd be great. Um, and that would be wonderful. Because the sooner we move on it, the sooner we can get service. Out. Get service. Because the ARPA, we have. A, so it it it's just us to decide how we want to spend our money. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for your Bye. information and helping with this. Thank you. I really appreciate you spending so much time. I, I really do. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Huh. Do we want to go on to mail? Sure. Um, I I wasn't sure about this um green. Yeah, that's deal. Yeah. Okay, that, I, that I, was the last thing on our agenda. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, unanticipated stuff. What, I don't know what that is. You know, well, I, I've been getting asked about. It's the Green Futures Act. Well, and the, and the, quite a few towns, if you look, quite a few towns have signed on to it. But I, um, um, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't really uh, had a chance to look into it. And so I, I didn't feel comfortable advocating right. for it until we all had a chance to discuss it. Yeah, I wanted to read a little bit. So another, th I've been getting asked quite a bit about, you know, can I have a statement? Do you support 100% green renewable energy? And and I um, I actually don't at the moment because um, it, it, it's not fully reliable yet. So, there, you know, it's, everyone always wants to, you know, of course I support renewable energy and, yeah. and ways to kind of reduce climate change, but not blindly. So I, I, I want to really think about the implications of what we're supporting. And so I would just like to know a little bit more about it and what, what does it mean? And, 
you know, because there's, you know, with the rain the last few days, a lot of people who have solar are not, you know, the lights, they're not running a laundry right now. So, you know, and, and if the wind's not blowing, you're not getting energy. So, um, and battery storage is an issue. I still implore people to watch Planet of the Humans. I will say that a couple more times, That's but why I, um, YouTube it, that form. it's yes. free and it's, uh, it's on YouTube and it's fascinating look at no it's the, depressing well but it is depressing we to, but it doesn't matter we have to you still have forward. to move forward have, correct we have, you have, we have to do everything we can i agree with that but just just smartly though and not like blindly so that's what i that's why i'm concerned when people say you support 100 percent renewable no because it doesn't function right right now and if we could find ways to make it you know and that's why i did support you know, allowing residents of the town to have a green energy source and, you know, the, through the municipal um, oh. aggregation plan. But um, so I just wanted to understand this a little bit. I don't know about the bill. I'd have to read it. Um, commission on the uh, this Commission on Electronic Millage. Oh, this is a radio department. Is this different than uh, the, No, I just want to make it? sure that people are aware of how much work our police department and John Petrork are doing oh. to make sure that yep. um, they are, we're, we're getting the new radio system. I mean, it's millions and millions of dollars saved for the county. Um, John Petrork is really yeah. making yeah. it happen. So the climate exchange is working with a coalition. So the Green Futures Act, which is H3292, which has earned 69 co-sponsors on Beacon Hill to date. The act gives local governments funds they can direct toward to green infrastructure projects from protecting green spaces to buying electric school buses. It also works to make sure the needs of frontline and environmental justice communities are not overlooked. I'm reaching to see if you're interested in joining your colleagues. Um, so I just wanna read the letter online, but that's not what this, Oh, so I looked that bill up, and that is. Oh, you exactly did. It's only I 19 found. pages. I mean, 19 sentences. Let's see. No, it's. I looked it up. That is the act. See, I don't think that things are properly. When you do a search on some of these, I don't think it's giving me exactly what I needed to give me. And so, yeah, I would recommend that the board look it up. I'm looking it yep. up right now, but I can't. Okay. Find exactly what they're talking about. Right. Okay, we'll do that. We'll we'll take well, the time see, to do can that. Can you just yep. respond back to them then that we don't we can we get more information? Send us a copy of the bill or something, or we can do that. I, I can yeah. hop on. Well, I can respond and ask that question. The reason I look it up on the house bills is usually there were, it says three two nine two, but it, that's not what's coming up. No. So yeah, that's not what this is about exactly mortgage that. bankers signing electronically. Exactly. <laughs> and that's what it's I mean, literally. Yep, that's, that's not it. Somebody's got their numbers so wrong. Can you yeah, can you just okay. follow up? Because I I I'm not comfortable. Yeah, until we read it, we'll be until good. We read it. Okay. Okay. Yep. That's why it wasn't making any sense to me. I keep on reading it. What the hell am I missing? It's like 19 <laughs> sentences. It can't be a green infrastructure. Bill. Okay. And that's it for mail, right? There's other than the, like you said, yep. the, the chief is doing an amazing job yep. with that. And, and the FERCOG has been doing a great job getting everybody the radios for the uh, 800. And then just the, the sewer stuff. Um, I, I gave you an well, update actually, on that. There's some things. Left and, and John has filled the whole, John, John Dianichi was the FERCOG person. So and he left. And chief so has taken over everything. Chief, chief has done everything. I know John he's Stewart amazing. Has done everything. Mm -hmm. I didn't know Dan left already. Yeah, he left. Oh, okay. Wow. So, yeah, Chief is doing a great job. So um, he's made sure that this is not there was not even a uh, break in any of the efforts. Or I know it's been, it's really worked out well. It really really has done. I mean, it's John does with everything. It's efficient, clean, done right. Mm. It works good. It's very nice to see. Okay, so mm -hmm. we, I, I guess the only thing, just backing up to our priorities, um, I'm going to get the meeting with Berkshire. Berkshire yeah. What, yeah. Kate, uh, he put out some dates. Case is going to look at those. We'll we'll find a time and then invite 
you know, the board. Okay, and then I talked to. Or maybe um, we'll do an initial Kevin and then have another today, and then so I'm gonna. I have a meeting tomorrow, and I will follow up with NRCS to see about River Road. Yeah. Okay. Just see if we can start the process. The really. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I think we can tie it to Elsa and we could meet at an event. And so, and this event is ongoing still. We still have more stuff coming on Friday. Yep. So if if we can if we can say it's this long term event, then maybe we um, can get going on that. I, I, I'll have to see, but I'll talk to Rita. Okay. 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 And uh, and then again, like I said, um, Carolyn Markenberg from the MVP program, which was at this meeting that I went to on yesterday, and um, Roy Cody from the EPA was there as well, and he was um, said that there was more money coming down for us. Good. Because one of the things that I was thinking of um, is uh, when we do if we keep Old Deerfield going. Um, one of the issues is with these long periods of drought is that we're, we get into permit violations because we just, it's just constant. It's not paying attention to what it is. So what we would want to do is to get some kind of tank storage available so that we would coordinate our releases with the releases from the hydro plants so that we would not be in permit violation. And that would be MVP eligible, but it's also um, would be I think the e and the EPA um, water water um, management control issues. I mean, this, this this guy was very interested in that kind of climate change stuff. So I think we can get it funded, and that way we wouldn't have any permit issues, you know, permit violation issues when the water is really really low, and you know, between uh, not having, you know, having drought and then not having any releases. So the idea is to somehow have it timed to the releases from the hydro plants so that you always have a full river when you're releasing into it, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, it's not a big deal in South Deerfield because you know the Connecticut River has such a volume, but just the last three or four years, the volumes are just not happening in the Deerfield River because of the weather. And I don't know if this is if it's going to continue, but it's been the last two or three years. Yeah. Jen? It's been so incredibly low that we're not even having, I mean, we're having problems with the fish. And so I, would, I don't know. I was going to say, I mean, yeah. Jennifer? I think that that's great, but we have to get through our other MVP grants and make sure that we're doing all the right. I mean, we paid catch up and we're so far. Oh, no, this is, we, we don't worry. This is, this is down. This way down the is, road this is money is for a year a year a year out at minimum okay okay and that's We're even three. just to apply for it making me nervous okay. <laughs> I don't know. No, no. this is this we'll is money that's coming for the next down the road that there was there was issues whether there was going to be any more additional money okay Good. but i guess there is there's going to be 300 million so I think we can, whatever we want to do, we should cover it by grants. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Well, Ms. Casey, you have any reports for us? Cost a lot of time. Well, I think I, I, I would like to make a comment. All of these grants cost us a lot of administrative time. Yep. And unfortunately we do not have that capacity. On the other hand, we may not have the capacity to train somebody to come in and work with us because we're so busy trying to do all the projects as well as the daily work. Casey, I know. I'd like you to hire a temporary person for the summer. I, I don't have the funding to do that. Well, we'll find it somewhere if we have to, if the board agrees. You know, it's but you're not the problem is we're David. putting so we much pressure on everybody somewhere. in the town offices, not just your office, all the other ones, that we're taking a jeopardy that you're going to start losing people, and we can't afford that. And so, because listen, we finally got saying, what I consider a real good team in place, and we're overwhelmed. And so, what I'm saying is, is even if I hire somebody, 
I don't have time to train that person. I haven't even finished training Jennifer because we don't have the capacity. We need to slow down. Have we told you where the fridge is yet, Jen? No, in the break, break room, fridge? I don't know where it is. There is a pen. Can we get it? It's not the one across the street. <laughs> No, I know it, it's, it's again, bandwidth. We said it, you know, I, well, I know that. nobody was around on Sunday when we were meeting, but because it wasn't televised, but um, we talked about bandwidth and staff ability to, to get through this. And, and it's, it's not just your, it's every department. There's so much work to do. It's, you could double the staff and still be behind schedule. It's so, so much. One thing on. I would suggest the board consider is Instead of being involved in the daily operations, focus on the policy making because the policy making is where we're going to make the most headway. We can do our jobs. We need the ability for you to trust us to do our jobs. Eh. No. Exactly, <laughs> Trevor. I don't think you trust me. Of course I do. You know I do. No. no. I just gave you the ability to sign $25,000 contracts. Of course I trust you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but you know it's just I do though I really and here do. again I, you know I trust there should be some town. possibilities some cares money left and some ARPA money left that you can bring somebody in even if it is just to get Jennifer offline and administer the Zoom meetings. So we've tried doing that. We have a person that works with us, Alex works with us, and we specifically put him on certain meetings um, where, as I said earlier, we're pivoting because we have a new operational model that we now have to figure out. Um, the problem is, is our CARES Act money is almost expended. Yeah. We're still, we still have FEMA CARES Act or FEMA requests that we have to finish out, but they have a timeline that's very no. slow. They don't have CARES Act. So I have, I wanted to be able to do something because we have an inspections issue. We need to be able to get them online software so that they can coordinate with applicants and go through processes. You know, it wasn't until last week that we figured out we could do it and we were going to use CARES Act money for it, or that's the plan. But now I have to refresh all the procurement because it's been six, eight months. So the problem is, is there's a constant need to pivot. And so every time there's a, a conversation that results in a change in what we have to do, it makes it difficult for us to do everything else. And that's really one of the reasons I wanted the board to discuss priorities. But in this meeting, now we've added two more meetings, a meeting with Jeff Squire that I can participate in, and then a meeting with the board. So how am I supposed to manage that on top of all the other meetings I have to go to? I had five yep. meetings today. And so even if I hire somebody and say, or recommend that the select board hire somebody to do a temporary thing, we have to figure that out in terms of funding. Because for instance, if we add personnel to deal with the social worker aspect of what you guys discussed, we don't have the capacity in the board of health office to handle that. And Ali brought it to your attention. There's a facilitation of information. It needs to be uh, a, 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 a different entity managing that, so dealing with that. a contracted service. Absolutely. But and we not still have an like administrative the responsibility for that. Mm -mm. Because if there is a nope. grant, let me finish. Well, if there's a ARPA grant, grant we money, have to yes. But we already know that's going to be an onerous process. No matter what the grant is, there is there's administrative background, there's contract management, there's payables management, there's reporting, there's figuring out that kind of reporting format because MVP is different from community compact reporting. And so that's what I mean about the background that it costs the town and grants. That's something yep. that is, is something that really needs to rise to the level of, of not just me seeing it, but everybody else seeing it. I'll yeah. stop, John. I was just going to say that um, in my former um, employment, um, we had a planner that also did the grant writing and the grant support. And I think that that would be, we, I spend a lot of time um, checking with council or doing research on my own to answer 
um, planning questions and zoning questions, which is fine. I, but I mean, I know sort of a basic, but I'm not a planner. So if we had somebody in the future that could help with the grant writing and um, and following them, it would free up a lot of the time that Casey and I spend on managing yep. those sections. Of, um, we talked about this when Kip was here. Mm -hmm. We talked about a planner and that economic development person and really? it's still needed um, so these five years later yeah to, to look at that because a lot of the a lot of the questions i mean i get the questions from the planning board and the zoning board and, mm -hmm. and other boards. no it's got to be shared yeah it, 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 I was the issue is, is we have to figure out like how it. to share it it's like right. And so that's another project in and of I know, I know. Everything we talk about is just a ton more work. Yep, it is. I but get we're it. We're not narrowing down what we're focusing on, and that's really the issue. Um, well, because we can't burn people out. We have got to recognize that if we don't slow down and really focus and and specify what needs to happen, that's what that burnout is going to happen. Yep. He's already working 13 hours today, so it's and that's what David. So, a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Is that what you're getting at? <laughs> Before we come up with another task <laughs> or another town that wants to work with us, right? Yeah. Oh, I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll We're done. That. Yep. Any further discussion? Nope. All those in favor? I, Trevor McDaniel. I, Carlin Ness. I, Dave Wolfram. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all.